Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marler, and this is Weird Darkness and our annual Halloween live stream. Uh, so glad to have all of you with me tonight. I'm going to be sharing stories as I normally do in the podcast, but we're also going to be doing a lot more. Uh, lots of giveaways. So be sure that you're signed up for the Weird Darkness email newsletter. That is where I'm going to be pulling the names from throughout the evening. And if you're watching me right now, well, you've already discovered the live stream. But in case something goes wrong with your stream, depending on where you're watching, you can look elsewhere. I'm streaming simultaneously on the Weird Darkness Facebook page, the Weird Darkness Twitter account, and the Weird Darkness YouTube channel. So if you lose the stream on one of those, you can switch over to another one and hopefully continue the fun. Uh, and the URL addresses for all of those should be found in the scroll that you're seeing here at the bottom of your screen. But if you're new to Weird Darkness, welcome to the show and happy Halloween. If you're already a member of this weirdo family, take a moment, invite somebody else to watch along with you, even if they are in another part of the world. I'm, I'm streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, so text it out to your friends to have them tune in during the live stream so they can get in on the fun. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at things here that I got to do. I got so many things going on at the same time. I want to make sure that I'm ready for the next piece. Okay, anyway. Uh, so pl please invite all your friends uh, to join us. Maybe post a link to this stream on your social media so others will know about it. And if you click on live stream at weirddarkness.com, you will see the links that you can follow for Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Coming up tonight, I'll have some creepy true stories surrounding Halloween. I'll be sharing some fun music videos. I have a couple of sing-alongs so that you and your friends and family can join in on it. I've got some fun songs and videos to watch. Plus, we're going to be watching this other camera over here. Uh, and that's the that's my doorbell camera. So that way we can see the trick-or-treaters as they stop by this evening. And since this is a live stream or a live stream, um, I, I can also respond to some of the online comments that you leave during the broadcast and already I've got a good 42 of them piling up. So we're gonna have a lot to uh, to look at once we get to that point. Uh, if you're having difficulty commenting, take a look at the video description for a link from StreamYard so that you can log in and leave a comment. And I will try to get to as many as I can throughout the evening. I'm obviously not gonna be able to get to all of them, but I'll, I'll do, do my best. Also, I'm gonna be doing giveaways tonight. Throughout the show, I will be giving away free Weird Darkness prize packs, and those include stickers, a fidget keychain, phone stand, wearable buttons, pen, magnets, the brand new Weird Darkness bumper sticker, and more. And if you hear me call out your name, you have to email me at the email address that you see on the screen right now before the live stream ends. If you don't, you lose your prize. So if you hear your name, email right away or you'll risk losing your free weird darkness swag and if you're not already on the email newsletter list just subscribe now as you're watching on the contests page at weirddarkness.com i'll be doing the giveaways a few times before this live stream is over and before we begin with the fun tonight is the last night of october that means it's the last night that i'm asking you to help me raise funds to combat depression and suicide through our overcoming the darkness campaign if you're watching and you're listening to this live, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com where you can make a donation of any amount to help the cause and also to learn more about those organizations that are going to benefit from your financial gift. And every dollar you give will be split equally and be donated to the International Foundation for Research and Education on Depression, the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, and Seven Cups. So please give generously and last i checked we were under a hundred dollars away from making our five thousand dollar goal but it would be great if we could do so much better than that last year we hit six thousand dollars and i set it for five thousand as a goal but you guys usually surprise me so we'll see how it goes tonight visit weirddarkness.com click on hope in the darkness it's also where you can find the weirdling woods night angel painting that we are auctioning off this year as well okay that's it you've waited long enough bolt your doors Lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Some. Well, before we get into the darker stories this evening, let's begin with something a bit lighthearted, but still appropriate for the occasion. It is hard to imagine today that Halloween and trick-or-treating weren't always a huge part of American culture. I mean, for all of my life, this has been a time of costumes, door knocking, and of course, candy. 
If you're my age, you might even remember those plastic costumes that you bought from Woolworths that tied behind you or your head and came with that mask that you, 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 you slipped over your face and you secured it with a nylon cord. It was hard to see, almost impossible to breathe. The cord usually snapped at some point in the night, but for one evening in the early 1970s, you were Batman, the creature from the Black Lagoon, or a character from the Planet of the Apes behind a cheap plastic mask. During my childhood, it seemed that trick-or-treating had been around forever, but it actually hadn't. It actually didn't make its way to America until the late 1920s, and within the last couple of decades, the tradition almost ended for good. See, it would take candy companies and a gang of cartoon kids to resurrect trick-or-treating after World War II and make it what it is today. See, World War II not only brought devastation to the entire globe, it also affected the goods and services available on the home front. In an effort to alleviate price hikes and hoarding, the Office of Price Administration printed war ration books with stamps that were used in exchange for goods. And thanks to the fact that as much as a third of the sugar imported to the United States came from Japanese-occupied Philippines, sugar was the first consumer commodity to be rationed. War Ration Book Number 1, nicknamed the Sugar Book, was excuse me, um, the Sugar Book was distributed starting May 4th, 1942. With deep cuts to sugar allowances, children's Halloween celebrations had to be drastically altered. Sugar rationing came to an end in 1947, and by the fall, the commercialization of Halloween started kicking off in ways it never had in the 1920s. Candy companies like Curtis and Brock, they wasted no time in launching Halloween advertising campaigns, but they weren't the only ones. Children's magazines like Jack and Jill and Children's Activities, they both featured trick-or-treating in their October issues. Parents who only dimly recalled their own Halloween traditions began reviving the fun for their own children. Costume parties became all the rage, along with hayrides, bobbing for apples, midnight spook shows, and spooky attractions. But it was the iconic comic strip Peanuts that really captured the imagination of American children. In October 1951, creator Charles Schultz ran the first of his Halloween-themed strips. The characters made their first appearance in ghost costumes, prepared for Halloween ghosting, as they called it. Patty even used Charlie Brown as the model for her jack-o'-lantern carving. These comic strips helped spread the popularity of Halloween. In 1966, a TV special, It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown, began its long run as a, Hall as a Halloween tradition. And the short was nominated for three Emmy Awards and made such an impression on America's kids that after it aired, children from all over the country sent candy to Charlie Brown out of sympathy. With the trick-or-treating tradition firmly established, it began growing in size. In addition to televisions and magazines, schools began reinforcing the tradition when the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, or UNICEF, launched a national campaign to raise money for children. They handed out cardboard boxes for kids to take with them while trick-or-treating. It turned out to be a pretty effective campaign, too, raising more than $175 million in the U.S. alone. So when you take the kids out to collect candy tonight, just remember how close we came to losing this tradition. And just take a few minutes to sit down with Charlie Brown again this year. You won't be sorry you did. Speaking of kids, uh, something really cool for those of you who um, who uh, follow the podcast. Every Saturday in October, we uploaded another episode of Micro Terrors, Scary Stories for Kids. We only did it for this month. That's all that was planned, but it has been such a success. And uh, the author, Scott Donnelly, loved it so much. He loves the feedback he's getting in January 2023. We're bringing it back for every Saturday. So if your kids love scary stories, we're going to do it on two different feeds too. We'll do it in the Weird Darkness feed so you can get it where you would normally be listening now. But we're going to create a separate podcast. We haven't done it yet, so don't look for it yet. But we're going to create a separate podcast just for Micro Terrors. So your kids can subscribe to that and only get the scary yet family-friendly uh, stories 
just for them. So I hope you're looking forward to that. I know I am. I had a blast putting them together. All right, let's check a few comments. We have 74 comments. Holy cow. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move back and, and and see how many we can we can take care of here. Uh, I'll take care of some of the longer ones. A lot of them are just saying happy Halloween. I appreciate that. Uh, just one resource says, hey, Darren, I hope you're feeling OK today, old fella. I've been waiting for your stream. Thanks. Well, uh, yeah, I'm actually feeling pretty good today, which is uh, which is a nice change. Uh, I had that sinus infection uh, for a while and also had the back pain. And today I'm feeling fine just in time for the Halloween stream. So that's pretty good. Uh, Janine says I'm already scared. <laughs> yeah, I know. But seeing my face will do that to people. Yeah, I understand. All right. Uh, Steve says, thank you for all your hard work. You're, you're very welcome, uh, Steve. Thank you very much for the nice comment. Uh, let's see here. Well, who else left some stuff? Um, Lamont asks, hey, Darren, how was your trip to the conference in Pennsylvania last week? Uh, the conference itself was great. I had a lot of fun in uh, Plattsburgh. Well, actually, it was, uh, I take it back, in, in Pennsylvania. Last week was, was Plattsburgh, New York. So I don't know if that's the one I was in Scranton, Pennsylvania a few weeks back. But if you're talking about the one last week, it was Plattsburgh, New York. And I, I had a blast while I was there. That's also the, the trip while on my way home, I injured myself. And that's where my, how my back, my back got bad. And I also had a sinus infection uh, during that thing. But the event itself actually went really well. And they've already invited me back for the next year. So uh, I, I really had fun there. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, see. So uh just all in, oh uh, who did this video i think you're referring to the one that i that started up the five minutes of movie quotes um uh i put it together but i grabbed all, all the quotes from youtube uh, i just grabbed it from a whole bunch of different resources uh, different places uh let's see here um matthew says the pumpkin singing is awesome that is the first video i added for this year as soon as i saw that going oh my gosh i gotta play that that's awesome uh let's see here uh alan says uh he's from south carolina first time watching welcome to the weirdo family alan nice to have you here uh robert says thumbs up for those folks who experience depression but are fighting the good fight uh yes robert yeah that's what our fundraiser is all about um so anybody if you want to to give to the fundraiser i, I would greatly appreciate it uh let's see here uh lamont says oh hell i remember buying penny candy too yeah those were the days, weren't they? Uh, now it's like a hundred pennies, Janine says. All right, let's see. Um, moving through here, Sonia says, well, hello from Victoria, Australia. Happy birthday to Weird Darkness and Darren. God bless. Well, thank you very much, Sonia. I think Sonia knows that my birthday is tomorrow, I think. Uh, I was born one day late. Uh, my grandpa's birthday was October 31st. Mine, November 1st. But that's okay, because in Mexico, it's Day of the Dead. So I'm actually born on Day of the Dead. Or if you're Catholic, All Saints Day, or All Souls Day, if you if you prefer. Um, Charzi said, "Love the yard decor." Ah, oh, well, you've seen the yard decor. Okay, well, we are going to be changing that. I see that I've that I've lost my connection to. Uh, hold on, two seconds here. Let me let me get back and. No, no, no. There, there it is. We need to reconnect to my to my doorbell. There we go. That that should fix it. Sorry about that. Is it going to work? It should have refreshed it. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. I don't know what just happened. Oh, I know. There we go. There we go. Now it's working. All right. <sighs> Technology. I'm telling you. It's just going to kill me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, love the decorations outside. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. You'll actually get a, a tour from the other side, from uh, from outside. I took a video so you can see everything from, from the kids' point of view. Um, let's see. I really like watching your wife take care of the front door. Do you usually get many children visiting? Um, it depends on the year. Last year, not so many, or the year before that, thanks to COVID. Uh, but this year we're supposed to have really nice weather it's not cold at all it's not actually kind of warm outside um no rain or snow in the forecast so we are planning for a lot of kids this year and i went out and actually bought extra candy today specifically for that 
Uh, let's see if I can find somebody who's not commented yet. Um, uh, Michaela says, can't wait. Well, you don't have to now. Here we are. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Zap said, any chance of a shout out? Sean from Ireland. Well, there you go, Sean. Shout out to you. Bill says, hey, Darren, we lost your outside camera. Yeah, thank you. I, I caught that. Um, coffee and weird darkness. That's actually what I'm drinking. I'm drinking uh, weird dark roast coffee with some pumpkin spice creamer in it. Nice. Okay, let's see here. Your story. Re um, Phantom Hive. Yeah, Phantom Hive. Your story reading is my favorite thing ever and back again for your live stream. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very nice of you to say. Um, Janine says, Robin is really scary. She's totally disappeared. <laughs> the video's back. Okay. Okay. I get it. All right. Um, let's see. You, you've commented. You commented. You commented. Uh, one more. Um, Got to download a bunch of episodes soon as my Thanksgiving tradition to listen to Eight Hour Drive. Wow. Uh, eight Hour Drive to the house, to your family's house. You listen to Weird Darkness the whole time. That's really... That's really cool of you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we'll take a look at some uh, some uh, comments a little bit later on as well, because we'll be doing that throughout the evening. Horrifying tales of torture, decapitation, and murder. And those are just the acts committed by the accusers. The Salem Witch Trials of 1692 remain among the most infamous episodes in all of American history. But across the sea, in Europe, Hundreds of years prior, similar events took place, this time involving persons accused of lycanthropy or shape-shifting into werewolves. According to Mental Floss, the first recorded instance of anybody being accused and convicted of lycanthropy occurred in Polony, France in 1521. As the story goes, a supposed wolf attack led authorities to the home of, Mi of Mikel Verdun, who, after being arrested and tortured, confessed to being a werewolf, along with two other men, Pierre Borgo and Philibert Monto. Borgo also confessed and told authorities of a dead, of a deal that is, made with three men dressed in black who agreed to protect his sheep in exchange for the rejection of his belief in God. He was given an ointment that allowed them to shapeshift into wolves, during which time they would stalk the land, killing and eating children. All three men were found guilty and were executed shortly thereafter. The accounts of lycanthropy that follow that first one are eerily similar in detail, many of them involving ointments and deals struck with other worldly characters. In 1598, the case of Frenchman Jacques Roulet, also known as the Werewolf of Cod, involved the use of a transformational salve, which Roulet used to murder and then eat several young children. Although he was sentenced to death for his crimes, a conviction of evil-mindedness instead sent him to an asylum where he received a religious education before being released just two years later. The fate of Peter Stubb, a German man, not so fortunate for him. After flat out confessing to having made a deal with the devil in which Stubb was gifted a belt allowing him to shapeshift for the sake of killing and consuming countless victims over 25 years, he was publicly executed in 1589 in a most gruesome way. Having his skin ripped away, arms and legs broken, and head removed before being burned. Following that, a man named Volkert Dirks claimed that during the Amersfoort Ock Utrecht trials in the Netherlands, and I'm sure I'm butchering that pronunciation, he and his family were able to shapeshift into wolves and cats under Satan's command as did Conti Hans and his spouse, who admitted to possessing the ability to turn into bears under Satan's command, though only after being tortured. Along with supposed deals with the devil, cannibalism is another recurring theme among all of these lycanthropy cases, including the 1573 execution of Frenchman Giles Garnier, who, uh, who was accused of killing and cannibalizing children who ventured into his neck of the woods and later confessed to being a werewolf. As many of these confessions of lycanthropy from Garnier and others only came later, long after the alleged incidents took place, most believe them to be either coerced through the use of torture, 
or attributable to the suspect's mental illness or low IQ, prohibiting them from understanding exactly what they were confessing to. Whatever the case, the Christian people of Europe at the time were opposed to the peasantry's practice of paganism. Thus, many believe these werewolf trials to have been nothing more than a scapegoat for widespread fear concerning occult and non-Christian practices. An example of the witch hunt mentality, much like the witch trials that would occur in America a century later. This brings us to the case of a teenage boy named Hans, who was tried during the werewolf trials in Estonia. With 18 trials accusing 18 men and 13 women of being werewolves over the years, the case of young Hans was perhaps the most famous. Only 18 years old, when he was arrested in 1651 on charges of lycanthropy, Hans quickly confessed to the charges brought against him. Admitting to having hunted as a werewolf for two years, Hans told the court of a man in black who bit him shortly before the physical changes occurred. Many believed the man in black to be the devil, and this mention of satanic forces qualified the werewolf to be tried as a witch and thus sentenced to death. When asked by a judge whether he felt more like a man or an animal, Hans replied that he probably, not unlike most 18-year-olds, felt like a wild beast, and that, he ch and that the changes within him could be measured both physically and metaphysically. Despite there being no physical evidence of any murders committed by Hans, he was sentenced to death, simply on the grounds that satanic magic had been performed upon him. While most of the accused never lived to see another day, not all werewolves were guaranteed a death sentence, such as 80-year-old Thais of Kaltebrun. Claiming to be a hound of God, Thais stated that he used his werewolf cloak to enter hell three nights a year where he battled devils and witches in order to ensure a good harvest for the next season. That's the kind of werewolf I want to be. He never admitted to having made a pact with a demon in exchange for lycanthropy. Theus was only convicted of practicing folk magic believed to encourage the rejection of God and was sentenced merely to a flogging, a much lighter punishment than so many of history's supposed werewolves had to endure. All right, let's check. Well, it looks like we lost our... Uh, <laughs> Looks like we lost our uh, connection outside again. Here we go. Uh, it's just now uh, a little after 5.30, and that's when the trick-or-treaters are really supposed to start showing up. So we'll start seeing some things happening over there pretty uh, pretty quick. However, like right now, right now, let's take a look at some of the comments that have come in. Joshua said, I love your show. It'd be so cool to hear you do an episode with The Witch of Pongo. I'm not familiar with that one. So uh, if, if you want to drop me an email... Uh, and let me know about that, Josh. I'd appreciate it. And that might actually uh, be something I could do. Uh, let's see. Um, Veronica ha says, Happy Halloween. Thank you very much, Veronica. Lisa, Happy Halloween from Southern Illinois. Uh, Tex says, Wish I was a werewolf. LOL. I don't know if that's something. I, I've always fantasized about it. But I don't think it's really something that I, I truly would want. It's fun to think about, but not actually do. Especially if you have no control over it. Uh, Matthew says, loving this. Happy Halloween, Spooks. Angela says, happy Halloween from South Australia. Wow. I'm addicted to the Weird Darkness podcast. This is my first live scream. Loving it. Well, thank you very much, Angela. Welcome to the live scream. Glad you could make it here. Uh, Bill says, we lost the out. Okay, okay, never mind. Where, where took care of that? Lamont said, I posted your show to Truth Social, Darren. Well, <laughs> thank you, Lamont. I don't know how many people on Truth Social, Social are going to care about me, but uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I love animals. Ginger. Zen says ginger wolf men are best. Stop it. You, you're just... You, flattery will get you everywhere. Uh, let's see here. Um, Chris says he can't watch all night like last year. That's okay, Chris. Don't worry about it. Um, once this is over, we're going to be posting it to YouTube. And I think it'll stay on Facebook and Twitter as well. So you can go back and... and uh, and, and look for it later, a little bit later on. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, okay. Happy, 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 happy. Um, one more. Uh, Boris says, we have the Loop Guru, French werewolf legend in my area. Uh, yes, I actually have covered that in the, in, the, uh, in the podcast. If you actually 
do uh, if you go to the Weird Darkness website and go to the search function, just type in Loop Guru and you should be able to see it. Uh, so, okay, that's that's it for now. We'll uh, we'll come back to these a little bit later on. If Halloween movies are any indication, bad things always happen on Halloween. That's just movie magic and the stuff of scary stories, you think. Halloween's just like any other day. And most of the time, yes, that's pretty true. Halloween goes by without any creepy hitch or spine-shilling occurrences to be seen. Spooky vibes and moonlight nights are peak Halloween energy, sure, but it's just another day, right? Well, not in the cases that I'm about to share. Sometimes unexplainable, scary, or downright horrible things do happen on Halloween. Costumes, decorations, and fear all accumulate in a melting pot of potential, which sometimes has disastrous consequences. If you're bummed that Halloween this year was different thanks to the pandemic, COVID-19, and the quarantine, uh, and that was especially true last year, well, maybe after I tell you these following true stories, you'll be glad you stayed home for All Hallows Eve last year. In 1992, a 16-year-old Japanese foreign exchange student in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, paid the ultimate price after accidentally ringing the wrong doorbell on his way to a Halloween party. Yoshihiro Hattori, he'd been unfamiliar with the neighborhood when he and a friend arrived at the home of Rodney Pears, a, near, a, a, a nearby neighbor who opened the door armed with a 44 Magnum revolver. Although Hattori allegedly said, we're here for the party, Pears claimed that he feared for his life and ordered the student to freeze. When Hattori misunderstood the command and kept approaching, Pears shot him. After being questioned, the perpetrator was arrested but later acquitted of manslaughter. It's not known what kind of Halloween costume Hattori wore to warrant such a reaction. Famed magician Harry Houdini. He claimed that he could take a blow to the abdomen without being taken down. And on, and on October 22nd, 1926, a student at McGill University asked if he could prove it. Houdini, who had been sitting in his dressing room during an engagement at Montreal University, obliged. Although he had allegedly braced himself, the student's four punches left the performer in great pain. After suffering for two days, Houdini decided to seek medical help. But by this time, he was suffering from a severe fever and acute appendicitis. Defying doctor's orders, he performed instead of undergoing the recommended emergency surgery. When the curtains closed, the magician collapsed, despite having his appendix removed afterward. Houdini passed away on Halloween, surrounded by family. On Halloween day in 1960, uh, 1963, the Indiana State Fair held a Holidays on Ice skating exhibition for a crowd of hundreds. The grand finale was not what anybody had expected. Unbeknownst to organizers at the Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum, propane gas had been leaking from a nearby tank into the poorly ventilated room. During a final act called Mardi Gras, the propane gas caught fire, leading to a horrific explosion that propelled onlookers from their chairs. The death toll was 74, and 400 additional people were injured. The tradition of throwing eggs at people on Halloween is, at best, a harmless prank. At worst, it can turn deadly. That was the case for Carl Jackson, the 21-year-old data entry clerk at Morgan Stanley, who usually never left the house on Halloween as he thought it was dangerous. On October 31, 1995, his worst fear became a reality. Jackson had decided to venture out to pick up his girlfriend's son from a party. Along the way, a group of teens pelted his car with eggs, so Jackson got out to confront them. But as he was getting back into the car, one of the pranksters pulled a gun and fatally shot him in the head. To this day, nobody knows what happened to Hyung Jong or Cindy Song, a 39-year-old grad student at Penn State University who disappeared without a trace after leaving a Halloween party after midnight in 2001. Song had stopped by a friend's home in the early morning hours, still decked out in her bunny costume, and accepted a lift home at about 4 a.m. 
Slightly intoxicated, she managed to get inside her home and drop off her belongings, including her backpack and cell phone. She had even removed her false eyelashes. But Song herself was never seen again. Investigators found no evidence of foul play and no activity on her credit cards or cell phone. The case eventually went cold. David Berkowitz. He became infamous in the 1970s as the Son of Sam serial killer. But not many people know that he could also predict the future. Well, sort of. Berkowitz was incarcerated when 39-year-old Ronald Seisman a 20 and a 20-year-old Elizabeth Platzman were beaten and shot to death in their Manhattan home in the early morning hours of Halloween in 1981. A fellow prisoner claimed that the son of Sam had previously told him that a cult was planning to carry out just such a massacre. Berkowitz was allegedly even able to describe the victim's apartment to a T. But police didn't have enough evidence to charge him with involvement in the murders, which still remain unsolved. If there were a prize for most morbid Halloween decoration in Frederica, Delaware in 2005, it would have gone to the body hanging from a tree. It would have been beaten, it would have beaten out the fake witches, the skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns dotting the neighborhood, and for hours people passed by admi admiring it. Of course, it had an edge over the other decorations. This was a real body. Police believe it was that of a woman who had committed suicide the night before. Note to self, not everyone is wearing a costume on Halloween. In 2012, in the early hours of the morning after Halloween, a 2 2 glad Marine spotted a uniform-clad man in a wheelchair and thought the man's costume was a weak attempt at mocking the military. So he attacked him. As the Marine leaned upon, uh, learned upon his arrest, the man's wardrobe was not a comment on our servicemen and women. He was, in fact, a disabled veteran. The most frightening thing about the graveyard kit um, that an Oregon woman bought at Kmart in 2012 was the note that she found inside of it. It was written by a Chinese factory worker who claimed that he and others were tortured and enslaved in a forced labor camp, making toys 15 hours a day with no pay or days off. And he went on to plead for the letter to be forwarded to the World Human Rights Organization. The woman did just that, and the Chinese worker was freed when the camp was exposed months later. It's bad enough to have collapsed and died alone on your own porch steps. But adding insult to injury, the morning after this 2012 Halloween tragedy, the mailman, assuming the body was simply an excellent Halloween decoration, sidestepped the deceased on his way to delivering the corpse's mail. Sometimes a costume is just too good. In 2012, a nine-year-old wearing a black outfit and a black hat with a white tassel was mistaken for a skunk by a relative and shot. Fortunately, the girl survived. The year was 1957, Halloween night. A couple was getting ready for bed when the doorbell rang. It was late, but the husband answered the door, ready to dole out more candy. Instead, an adult wearing a mask shot him in the chest, killing him. Was it a trick-or-treater dissatisfied with the candy selection? Not quite. The murderer, it turns out, was the girlfriend of a woman who had had an affair with the murdered man's wife. The woman convinced her girlfriend to do away with the husband in order to have the wife for herself. Candy. It might be important for Halloween. It's certainly not worth your life, though. It was Halloween night 2011 when a 55-year-old Chicago resident realized his candy bag was missing. He blamed a neighbor for the missing sweets and took his revenge to an extreme, stabbing his neighbor to death with several steak knives. Halloween, it's known for both tricks and treats, but some pranks just go too far. In 1998, a Bronx man was in the car with his girlfriend to pick up her nine-year-old son from a Halloween party. When a group of teens started egging the car, the man got out and an argument started. After he sat back down in the car, though, one of the teenagers shot him fatally in the head. On Halloween Day in 1955, Marilyn Damon went to a food fair on Long Island to do some shopping. 
she brought her children, two-year-old Stephen and seven-month-old Pamela, with her. Telling Stephen to be good and watch his little sister, she left the children outside while she went into the store. She returned ten minutes later to find that her children had disappeared, stroller and all. Pamela's baby stroller, with the unharmed seven-month-old inside, was found a short distance away, but Long Island police were never able to locate Stephen. What happened to him remains a mystery. And people thinking dead bodies are Halloween decorations seems to be a gruesome trend in these Halloween stories, doesn't it? And we'll have several more later on. However, in 2017, the opposite actually happened. In mid-September, police in Greene County, Tennessee, received a panicked phone call from a man who believed that there was a beheaded corpse in his neighbor's driveway. Police arrived on the scene only to find that the owner of the home had actually just put out his creepy Halloween display a little early. Do not call 911 reporting a dead body, reported the police. Instead, congratulate the, homer, the homeowner on a great display. All right, let's take a look at some more of the comments that came in. Um, let's see here. Um, we're getting, seriously, you guys are going to start getting, you're going to get political in there? Come on. Uh, Aaron says, thanks for the trick-or-treat stream. We don't get trick-or-treaters here, but it's nice to still get to see a decorated yard and costumes. Well, I'm, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Janine, who, who is this singing? That was uh, Jonathan um, Coulter. Jonathan Coulter? Is that right? I, I'm, I'm having a brain fart right now. You can go back and listen listen to the uh, to listen to the podcast later on, and you can get that. I do put the uh, I, I do put the information about that a little bit later on. Uh, Doc says less than fifty dollars away from fundraising goal to a weird darkness. Uh, well, thank you, Doc. I appreciate you posting that online. Thank you so much. That's really I really appreciate that. Uh, Josh asks, you ever did a story for the podcast that was so bizarre that it just made you almost didn't believe it? Occasionally, I, I, uh, that does happen occasionally, um, but I tend to believe people unless I unless I unless I have reason not to. Um, I'll I'll go ahead and believe people. I'm trying to think. There, in fact, there was one in a chamber of comments that I I shared a, a few chamber of comments is back that I even mentioned that I had to talk to the guy and make sure that he wasn't sending in a story for just the podcast like a creepy pasta that it that was a true story because it did not read like a true story at all uh so if you go back and listen to the chamber of comments you'll probably uh you'll probably see that one or hear that one that is uh michelle says i love being a weirdo this is my first year watching the halloween live stream welcome michelle thank you very much uh let's see here uh we've got um uh, Marta says, nearly midnight here in Sweden. Perfect for watching this. It's amazing how many people are watching outside the U.S. That is so cool. Uh, Letha says, hey, Darren, fairly new listener, joined within the last few months, and I got to say your content gets me through the day. Stay weird. P.S. Loving this live stream. Thank you, Letha. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Um, going to another one, going to another one. Uh, Tim says, this is a great live stream so far and lots of weird, weirdo love. Thank you. Um, Scott Baylor says, second year watching. All right. Well, thank, thanks for returning. Appreciate it. Um, Bill Taylor says, too bad I can't get weird dark roast coffee here in Canada. I know. I'm really sorry about that. Um, I've talked to the roaster to ask if they ever have any plans of changing that. And at the moment, they don't. And it would actually cost them more to, to mail it than it does to make it. And so they've decided not to do that, at least at this time. Um, so, okay, that's that's good for now. Okay, I share this story every year during the Halloween live stream because first, it's terrifying. Second, it's a true story. And third, it thwarts a long-held belief about Halloween and trick-or-treating that we've all held since we were children. If you're a parent, what is your greatest fear? Just about every person that I know with a child is going to answer that question almost immediately. It's that some sort of tragedy might befall their children. Accidents, calamities, automobile crashes, natural disasters, fires, I mean, the list goes on. All these things terrify parents. These are the things that keep them awake at night. 
staring at the ceiling of their bedrooms and wondering how they would handle the nightmare if something terrible happened to their child. Of course, accidents and calamities are cruel twists to fate. Bad luck, if you believe in luck, or perhaps providence if you don't, it plays no favorites. The idea that a terrible accident might occur that claims the life of your child might keep you from sleeping at night, but in the end, there's really nothing you can do about it. Accidents happen, right? But what about that terrible thing that's not an accident at all? What about when the horrible death of a child comes at the hands of another? There are, without a doubt, killers who walk among us. Is there a more loathsome killer lurking in the darkest corners of America than one that would prey on children? Such monsters have been with us since the first settlers arrived on American shores. We often fool ourselves into believing that the good old days were actually good, but that is far from the truth. Monsters have always been with us. They stalked the innocent in the days when children stayed close to the rugged settlements of the colonies, afraid to wander into the dark forest. They were among us before the Civil War claimed the lives of thousands of men and boys. These monsters claimed the lives of the young and naive during the Gilded Age, at the dawn of the, of the 20th century through the Depression and beyond. Let me get back to our, let me uh, start up our our video again. There we go. Okay. These monsters, they're not the stuff of fiction. They are blood-curdlingly real. They've been among us since the nation began, and they are with us still, always looking for their next victim. We know this, as did our parents and their parents before them. The fear of strangers and their terrible deeds has been rooted in the minds of multiple generations of Americans. We created myths and legends and monstrous shapes, hoping to scare children so that they never strayed too far from the welcoming light of home. And yet, blood was spilled. Children vanished, never to be seen again. They became faces on milk cartons and cautionary tales of what happened when children were left alone. We must keep our children safe, parents told themselves. But even the most watchful eyes weren't always enough. Our cautionary tales created one of the most popular and most terrifying urban legends of all time. It involved just two things, a babysitter and a telephone. It tells the story of a babysitter who's been left in charge of young children for the night. The parents, hoping for a much needed night out of dinner and a movie, left this trusted neighbor girl with their children. She was experienced, she was reliable, and the parents had nothing to fear. The night is quiet, and after finishing some homework, the babysitter turns on the television, and the telephone rings. When the girl answers, she hears a man's harsh voice, Have you checked the children? Startled, she, uh, she uh, assuming it to be a prank, she hangs up the phone. The telephone rings again, and once more, the same man's voice repeats the question. The babysitter slams down the receiver, but it keeps ringing, and the same man keeps asking about the children. Now terrified, she phones the police, who assure her that they'll have the calls traced and find out who has been harassing her. A few minutes later, the police operator calls back with horrifying news. And you could probably say it along with me. The calls are coming from inside the house. When officers arrive on the scene, they find a distraught babysitter and two murdered children in the upstairs nursery. The killer had somehow gotten into the house. He made the calls to terrorize the babysitter and lure her upstairs to her death. Of course, this morality play ends in tragedy for the young woman who did not watch the children closely enough. She loses her mind and has to be locked away in a mental institution for the rest of her life. Of course, this is only a story, right? I mean, we all know it's just an urban myth that illustrates the perils of being a babysitter and the fact that children are never really safe, even in the most innocent of circumstances. Stories like this, and a lot of others like it, have been told and retold thousands of times over the years. It's only a story. Or is it? When you were growing up, how many times did you hear stories like that one? Or were told never to talk to, sketchy, to a sketchy-looking man that your mother pointed out on the street. Or to never accept a ride in a car with someone you didn't know. 
or to never accept candy from strangers, especially at Halloween. It was at Halloween when every horror story that your mother could ever imagine came to life. Never knock on a door of a house without a porch light on. Never accept treats that were not professionally packaged. Never bite into an apple that your parents had not carefully checked beforehand. I mean, they were filled with needles and razor blades, don't you know? It all boiled down to never take candy from strangers. But that was crazy, wasn't it? I mean, it's Halloween for Pete's sake. Who's evil enough to stick razor blades into apples or put poison into candy bars? Those are just stories, aren't they? Those kinds of things never really happen. Well, as it turns out, stories like this often get started for a reason. And sometimes the monster is not a stranger at all. On Halloween night, 1974, Timothy O'Brien and his sister Elizabeth had anxiously waited for their father Ronald to get home from work so that they could go trick-or-treating. The family, which included their mother Diane, lived in the suburb of Deer Park, Texas. Ronald was an optician at Texas State Optical in Houston, was a deacon at the Second Baptist Church. He also sang in the choir there and was in charge of the local bus program and was, as far as everybody knew, a wonderful, loving father. When he finally walked through the door of the family home, the children rushed to him, hurrying him back out to the street. Still wearing his white optician's lab coat, perfect costume, Ronald took Timothy and Elizabeth out to celebrate Halloween. They met some friends, and they went to the first house of the night. Timothy rang the doorbell. There was no answer. If anyone was home, they were taking far too long to answer the door. The children impatiently ran to the next house on the block, leaving Ronald to catch up. And when he did, he had five giant pixie sticks in his hands. Tubes of pure sugar goodness that the kids couldn't wait to consume. But Ronald promised he would distribute the candy among the children when they got back to the house. It was late when they returned home. Ronald got the children ready for bed, but before he fell asleep, Timothy asked for just one more treat from the night's Bounty of Sweets. He chose a 22-inch giant pixie sticks. The sugar had hardened into the tube, so his father helpfully rolled the candy between his hands to loosen the contents. Timothy poured the confection into his mouth, but his face wrinkled in disgust. It tasted terrible. Ronald quickly ran to get some Kool-Aid for his son to wash the bad taste away. Timothy never had the chance to drink that Kool-Aid. Within moments, he began to choke, vomit, and convulse. Something was terribly wrong. When paramedics arrived, they found Ronald cradling Timothy in his arms as the little boy gagged and foamed at the mouth, and he was pronounced dead at the hospital less than an hour later. An autopsy later revealed the eight-year-old had died from a fatal dose of cyanide. But where had, it, where had it come from? The top two inches of the giant pixie sticks that Timothy had been so excited about contained enough poison to kill two grown adults. The little boy never had a chance. Word spread about Timothy's death, naturally starting a panic in the community. Numerous parents in Deer Park and the surrounding area took the candy that their children had collected from trick-or-treating to the police, terrified that it might be laced with poison. None of it was, but the authorities could understand the fear that Timothy's death had caused. They had already started their investigation into the boy's murder. Thankfully, the other four laced pixie sticks, which Ronald O'Brien claimed he received from the first house on the trick-or-treating route after the kids had run ahead, had not yet been eaten. When questioned by detectives, Ronald sobbed as he suggested that an unidentified monster must have handed out poisoned candy to trick-or-treaters. He told police he vaguely remembered where the candy had come from, but he never got a good look at the owner. All he saw was a shadowy hand clutching the pixie sticks from behind a door. The police went to the address and questioned the owner of the house, Courtney Melvin, who worked as an air traffic controller at Hobby Airport. But the police were confounded when they learned that he had not left work until 10.30 p.m. on Halloween night. His wife had stopped answering the door when she ran out of candy around 6.45. That was before Ronald O'Brien claimed that he was even there. In addition, Mrs. Melvin had not given out any pixie sticks that night. Detectives interrogated the entire neighborhood and still couldn't find the source of the deadly candy. Ronald O'Brien was grief-stricken by his son's death. 
He was already having a terrible year, and Timothy's death seemed to have pushed him over the edge with grief. Ronald was eight months behind in car payments and was being threatened with repossession. He had defaulted on several bank loans and was suspected of theft at Texas State Optical and was close to being fired. He held 21 different jobs over the last decade and was more than $100,000 in debt. He further strained his family's finances by taking out a $10,000 life insurance policy on his children earlier in the year, to which his wife protested as an unnecessary expense. She also probably would have objected to the additional pair of $20,000 life insurance policies Ronald took out on Timothy and Elizabeth on October 3rd if she'd known about them. And she definitely would have been horrified to find out that mere hours after Timothy's death, her husband called to collect on the policies. The police didn't know about the life insurance policies, not yet anyway. But they did discover that Ronald had visited a chemical supply store in Houston to buy cyanide just a week before Halloween. He left without purchasing anything after the smallest amount available to purchase was five pounds. When they found out about the life insurance policies, they were convinced they had their man. Detectives theorized he had laced the candy with poison so that he could kill his own children for the life insurance money. Poisoning their friends with the extra pixie sticks would help cover up the crime. Luckily, none of the other candy was ever eaten. Investigators repeatedly questioned Ronald, but he maintained his innocence. He blamed the whole thing on some mad poisoner, just like in the stories who handed out Halloween candy laced with poison or needles and candy apples with razor blades inside. I mean, surely the police had heard those stories, right? O'Brien was arrested and brought to trial. On June 3, 1975, a jury took only 46 minutes to find the dedicated father and devout member of the Second Baptist Church guilty of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder. Ronald was sent to death row in Huntsville, Texas. He was so hated by other inmates, they reportedly petitioned to hold an organized demonstration on his execution date. They had to wait a while for that date, though. His first execution date was set for August 8, 1980, but his attorneys managed to drag things out until March 31, 1984. Shortly before midnight, he was executed by lethal injection. Outside of the prison, a crowd of about 300 demonstrators cheered while others yelled, Trick or treat! Ronald O'Brien didn't just kill, just kill his son or, and try to kill four other children. On October 31, 1974, he also killed the idea of Halloween for several generations of kids that hadn't even been born yet. Ronald, who was known as the Candyman by his fellow death row inmates, successfully perpetrated the legend that there are strangers out there intent on killing children with poisoned Halloween candy. The truth was, there had never been a case of a stranger handing out poisoned candy to kids on Halloween. Ever. That really had just been an urban legend. But in 1974, there finally was such a case. But he was no stranger. Ronald O'Brien was a monster in human form and a nightmare brought to life. one of the most terrifying stories that I think I've I've ever told. All right, well, let's have a little bit of fun now and check on some of those comments that have been coming in. Um, uh, let's see here. You guys are talking amongst yourselves, so I have to, have to see. Uh, Aaron says the monkey's paw, uh, a good classic. You guys are, are you talking? Um, I love... Okay, you guys are talking amongst yourselves, so I have no idea what you're referring to. <laughs> uh, just, uh, be right back. I take the dogs out. Oh, okay, I, I, hold on, I gotta, I gotta scroll back here. You guys are. Um, Aaron says I always liked the one where the girl was dared to put a knife at a grave in the middle of the night, but she stabbed her dress by accident and died of fright. Never heard of that one. Uh, is, is, if, if that's an urban legend, uh, if you got a link to that or something, send it to me. I'd like to like to see that one. Um, Layla said, I just checked my email. I've never received one from you. I signed up again, hoping to win. 
Uh, well, Layla, you're probably in. You, um, you might want to check your uh, you might want to check your junk mail folder or spam folder just to make sure. But um, most of the time, that did that's fine. Um, let's see here. Uh, Sue says they did happen. I remember cases in our town when I was in grade school. If you're referring to the uh, the poisoning and stuff like that, it, it might have been uh, back in 1974. Is the is the first incident? So I don't know. I don't know how old you are. Where where, where that puts you? Um, that was written by uh, author Troy Taylor. So and so I just assume that he he knows what he's talking about. Uh, David says he discovered Weird Darkness a couple of years ago. Listen to it a lot. Really like your voice and energy, Darren. First time being able to watch. Thank you for the shows. Well, thank you, David. I I appreciate the very nice comments. Uh, Maria says hi, Darren. Question: Are you ever going to travel? with the Weird Darkness Machine to Texas around Houston or Galveston. Uh, the Weirdo Wagon is scheduled to be in Plano, Texas um, in the near future. There is there is a, a Supernatural TV show fan convention taking place there. And uh, I've got a table there so I can give out all my free, free goodies and stuff. I don't think I'm near Houston or Galveston in the near future. That being said, um, as I say often, if you know of of an event that you that you think I should be a part of in your area, let me know about it. And if I have the weekend available and um, you know I'm not already booked doing something else, I'll take a look at it and I might actually might actually go. I'm I am actively looking for for places to go. So um Lamont said that was a cool video. I'm assuming you're talking about the uh the uh oh, what was that called? The, uh, Mountain King King Mountain Mountain King whatever anyway the, <laughs> I hate when I do a live show and it suddenly I can't I can't think of words that I'm I'm looking for. But the acapella group, that's I'm sure that's what you were thinking of. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jeffrey says headless horseman is his favorite. Uh, okay. Um, Dee Dee says that was weird and funny. I'm sure you're talking about the about the video. Um, everyone in this video looks familiar, but I can't place any of them. Okay. Uh, first year watching from Texas. Josh says you got to watch the live stream. Um, Jeffrey said, "Well, I've shared a number of Halloween cautionary tales on Weird Darkness over the years, but I doubt I've shared a weirder one than this. You're going to want to pay really close attention because the language of this is a bit antiquated, but it is totally worth it. And before I get into this story, it's best that you know." that there's an old tradition on Halloween for a young single man or woman to throw hemp seed over their shoulder three times saying, hemp seed, I saw thee, hemp seed, I saw thee, and he or she that is to be my true love come after me and draw thee. They would then look over their shoulder and hopefully see an apparition of the person that they would someday marry gathering up on the hemp. Okay, now for the article that I came across, this is from the Cork Mercantile Chronicle from November 22nd, 1802. I found this at newspapers.com. This, this is a trip. Again, it's antiquated language, so something just to keep in mind. Um, before we do that, let me start up that, that video again on the doorbell. There we go, okay. So here's the here's the article. The ceremony of, I almost, need, almost want to do an, uh, <laughs> an accent on this, but I won't. The ceremony of sowing hemp seed on Halloween is known to most of our readers. A young girl of the name of Mabel Carr, servant of Mr. Mathewson, type founder, would need would, uh, would needs have her Halloween on Monday week, and notwithstanding the earnest remonstrances of her master, who represented the impropriety and absurdity of prying into the secrets of futurity, she would not be dissuaded from sowing her hemp seed on that night. About ten o'clock, she accordingly went into the foundry alone, with a light in her hand, which she placed on one of the tables while she performed her incantations. She walked through the shop several times, pronouncing aloud the words used on such occasions, and so anxious was she to see something, as she termed it, that having seen nothing, she gathered up the seed to sow it a second time. In the course of this second sowing, according to her own account, a tall, meager figure presented itself to her imagination. She shrieked aloud and ran immediately into the house, all the doors being open. After relating all that she had seen, she went to bed, placing the Bible under her head. She rose on Tuesday and went through the labors of the day in apparent good health, but the evening appeared. But in the evening, uh, uh, something appeared 
she, let me try that again. But in the evening, she appeared somewhat timid. She, however, had her supper as usual and went to bed without any symptoms of fear. Next morning, she was called but did not answer. Again was called but still no answer. A daughter of Mr. Matthewson's then rose, went to her and found that she was very sick and that she had been so during part of the night. Tea was ordered for her, but before it could be prepared, she was seized with a stupor. The pulse became sunk and breathing difficult, and the hands swollen and blackish. A medical gentleman was instantly called. He said it was an attack of an apoplexy, which she could not survive more than 10 minutes, and in rather less than that time, she expired, the blood bursting from her nose, mouth, etc. The surgeon, on being informed of the transactions of Monday night, was clearly of opinion that the impression made on her imagination by the fancied apparition was the cause of this fatal catastrophe. We have given the particulars of this unfortunate affair so minutely because reports injurious, injurious to a very worthy man have gone abroad on the subject. It has been stated that one of Mr. Matthew's men concealed himself in the foundry to alarm the girl during her foolish probation. It is false. Mr. M's people leave off work at 8 o'clock. This happened at 10, and there was not a soul within the shop but herself. It has been further stated that she fell into a faint on the appearance of the fancied specter and was left to die in that situation. It will be seen from the above authentic statement that this is an absolute falsehood and a most malicious one. So, however you celebrate Halloween this year, avoid the hemp seed. Unless, of course, you want to see something. You know, now that I think of it, listening to this show, you probably do. All right, let's check out a few more of the comments that have been coming in. Uh, they're coming in on Facebook, Twitter, and and uh, also YouTube. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Janine saying, explain the stream stopping for a policy violation. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it could be that I'm playing copyrighted material in the live stream. That might be part of it. I don't know, but I'm looking at the YouTube right now and it appears to be continuing. So, and you're commenting on YouTube. So I'm not sure what it is. Um, the YouTube stream may have stopped briefly because I was playing a video and then after the video stopped, they, they uh, continued it. That might've been what it was. Um, I don't know. So, um, yeah, I thought Monster Mash was in the public domain as well, but I guess, I guess not. Okay. Well, you learn something new every day. Um, Aaron wants to know who the winner was. The winner this last time was Deborah L. Uh, excuse me, Deborah Lezich. Deborah Lezich. So, um, the singer reminds me of Boris Karloff. Well, yeah, that he was actually doing a Boris Karloff impression, uh, during the song. That was actually his, his intent. I'm really sorry you guys couldn't see all of that song. That kind of stinks for you guys. Um, Tex says, time to hunt down an angry mob and hunt down YouTube for raking away the stream. Let's go, y'all. Evil dies tonight. <laughs> nice uh, nice quote from Halloween Kills. I love it. Okay. Uh, you're, uh, Tracy's watching on the on phone, on Facebook, and on YouTube, on TV. Um, did the same thing happen on Facebook, Tracy, or was it just YouTube? I would actually like to know. So, um, uh, Joshua says he got to hear War of the Worlds for the first time last night. Could you imagine if you uh, did that to, on th this day and time? I don't, I, it wouldn't be the same nowadays, but um, somebody did comment on, I think it was on, on the YouTube that I, that I posted on that. Somebody commented that that is exactly the reason why they don't announce that aliens are real today, because they think that's exactly what would happen, like what War of the Worlds did. Um, Tracy Will says it did work on Facebook. Okay, good. All right. So maybe I'll want to, uh, switch over to Facebook. Uh, that's, that's up to you. Um, Ike says, good evening. Hope you're having a wonderful Halloween. I'm watching Halloween and listening to your show. Well, thank Ike. Uh, thank you, Ike. Appreciate it. Um, okay. I think that's everybody for now. Okay. 
that's that's most of the big comments. The rest of you, the rest of them are. I'll hear Stephanie saying, uh, "Love your podcast, Aaron. First time being able to watch the live stream. Where can people send in their creepy stories?" Uh, good question. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, anybody can do. In fact, I love getting your creepy stories. Once a month, I do something called Fireside Frights. And if you want to send in your story, that's what it'll be included in. Just go to WeirdDarkness.com and click on Tell Your Story. And you can uh, you can turn in your story there. Just WeirdDarkness.com and then click on Tell Your Story. If you rather have just a URL, it's WeirdDarkness.com slash submit. Um, but it works either way. Um, if you like what you're hearing tonight, if you want some more Halloween from me, and if you also want to chat with me online, uh, you can tune in tomorrow night to my syndicated radio show. It is on over 40 stations around the nation on the weekends, but I also do a replay on Tuesday nights at kcorradio.com. And while that show airs, I hang out in their chat room and converse with any weirdos who want to talk. So that's tomorrow night. Uh, it, and, uh, by the way, tomorrow night will be my Halloween episode as well. So we do this every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern. It's at kcorradio.com. Just click on listen live when you go there, and that'll bring you to the online player to listen. And then down that page, you'll see the chat room where I'll be. So I hope you'll join me tomorrow night if you can. It's in the chat room, uh, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern at kcorradio.com. Okay, that moment when you realize the fake body at a haunted house is real, that's awesome. Until that is, you realize it's not a real person playing dead, but a real person that is dead. That's the stuff psychiatrists live for. Real dead body Halloween decorations are for the macabre and certainly something to avoid for the faint of heart. These overly creepy Halloween decorations are, well, equally equal parts frightening, equal parts contemptible, but 100% messed up. These are real dead people that ended up mistaken as or purposely used for the purposes of making a spooky night or or setting uh, make or the night or the setting seem more authentic. The real reason Poltergeist was cursed. You may have heard about that. Over the years, the curse of the Poltergeist movies has been one of the most retold rumors in Hollywood. Three films in the franchise, four of the principal actors dead within years or even months of the film's release. And now we all know the Poltergeist films were not done on or strictly for Halloween, but the spooky stories on and off the set are said to have been the result of some sinister props that set off a gory chain of events. In 1982, months after the release of the first Poltergeist film, Dominique Dunn, the older sister from the movie, was strangled to death by her ex-boyfriend. In 1985, Julian Beck, who played the bad spirit on Poltergeist 2, died of stomach cancer. In 1987, Will Sampson, the good spirit in Poltergeist 2, he died after a heart-lung transplant failed to take. And finally, at least so far, in 1988, Heather O'Rourke, who appeared in all three films, died of a septic infection that caused severe bowel blockage. She went through all the filming of Poltergeist 3 with symptoms of this condition and eventually died of cardiac arrest en route to the hospital to remove the blockage. She was 12 years old. People die, yes, but why so many from this one franchise? Was something done on the sets of the film to anger the spirit world? Was something done to tempt the ire of other world, uh, of, of the another world while filming the movies? Well, it was all in the props. As has been revealed in many interviews with the surviving cast and crew over the years, real bones and skeletons were used as set decorations in Poltergeist, the first movie, and the second. A weird fact was that it was not revealed to the actors in the first movie that they were swimming in that hole, you know, with real skeletons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that led uh, actor Will Sampson performing a ritual on the set of the second movie to exercise the spirits that might be might be present during filming. There was also an actual mummy found on the set of the Six Million Dollar Man TV series. In 1976, the Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California, was being prepped to film an episode of the Six Million Dollar Man. The props for the scene, which would take place in a funhouse, were being assessed by the director when he saw a man hanging from a rope in the corner, and he didn't like that prop. 
A crewman went to move the dummy and was shocked when the dummy's arm came off, exposing a real human arm bone. Now, before you ask, no, this was not the $6 million man Halloween special. But finding out a human prop is the real thing is still pretty creepy. Medical examiners identified the body as a vagabond from Oklahoma named Elmer McCurdy, following by a posse... Uh, Following by a uh, followed by a posse sent to track the man after he and a handful of others robbed a train of forty six dollars and a shipment of whiskey, McCurdy once found once he was found was embalmed with arsenic and used as a prop by the undertaker who received the body. He charged people a nickel to come see the corpse of the bandit who wouldn't give up. Well, that body changed hands a few times until somehow it ended up as the property of the amusement park in Long Beach, where unfitting visitors. Mar uh, unwitting visitors marveled at this dummy for years that looked so realistic. Just to discover later, it was an actual human body. New York morgue technicians, they staged a photo shoot with dead bodies. You ever wonder what happens to you after you die? I mean, not in the metaphysical heaven-hell sense, but your physical, your physical dead body? Assuming that you die under somewhat normal circumstances, your body goes to a morgue for processing, like the one in New York attended by mortuary technician Cahill Brosfield. When the office of the chief medical examiner took over the supervision of the Brooklyn morgue where Brosfield was employed, things started to calm down in what was once a raucous work environment. And by raucous, I of course mean to say that they used body parts of corpses as playthings. They took pictures, in November of 2009, Blackfield claims a stack of Polaroids, which depicted him and other unidentified lab technicians posing with severed heads and other body parts in the morgue, was stolen from his possession and used in an attempt at blackmail. Several months after he refused to pay his blackmailer for silence, the photos made their way to the management and Blasfield was suspended from his position without pay. Maybe the worst thing about this body parts as props situation is the fact that Blackfield and the other technicians, they didn't limit themselves to just Halloween time to take their pictures. Some of the confiscated photos were dated while others were unlabeled, leading investigators to believe the practice spanned years. A dead body Halloween decoration was on a person's porch and it turned out to be the real thing. On October, on a, a day in October 2009, Mustafa Muhammad Zayed's neighbors, they thought that he had gone all out with his Halloween decorations for the year, going so far as to put a slumped over, sinister looking dummy on his porch to frighten his neighbors. For days, neighbors and guests marveled at the authenticity of the prop, though nobody rang Mr. Zayed's doorbell to ask where he had purchased this amazing dummy. After a few days, Someone in the 75-year-old's Mar uh, Marina del Rey, California complex, they suspected something might be amiss with the prop and called the police, who discovered it was not a fake body after all, but Zayed's corpse on the porch, gradually decomposing for almost four days after a single gunshot wound to the eye ended the man's life. The body had been looking over the complex for days without anyone noticing that it was not a decoration but the body of their former neighbor. There was also the case of the dead woman in the tree. In Frederica, Delaware, a 42-year-old woman hung from a tree, simultaneously frightening and impressing passers-by for hours before it was discovered the lifelike corpse hanging from the tree had actually been void of life since that morning. On October 25th or 26th, 2005, an unidentified woman climbed a tree a quarter mile from her home and jumped from a tall branch in an apparent suicide. Because of the proximity to Halloween, all that drove by the display assumed it to be just a clever display for the public and failed to report the body until much later in the morning. And then there's the woman on the fence. Ohio residents were alarmed to find out what they presumed to be a corpse-like Halloween decoration hanging from a fence. Turned out to be an actual dead person on October 31st, 2015. Police investigated Donnie. Co I, you gotta gotta love uh, gotta love pronunciation of words, uh, uh, proper names. Donnie Koshinur, Uh They investigated. We'll just say they invested. They investigated Donnie uh, for the murder of Rebecca Cade, a local woman. However, he was ultimately found not guilty in 2017, 
and local construction workers believed Cade's body to be a Halloween decoration, only to find out later that it was, in fact, a dead woman. Okay, let's take a look at some of our other um, comments that have come in. Michaela says, Facebook disconnected me after I switched to that to that to hear the music. Oh, so maybe maybe Facebook is cutting this out. If not, I'll keep that in mind for next year. Uh, listening while waiting for trunk or treat. All right, Monica, we did a trunk or treat uh, the other day and had so much fun with it. Um, we, we did it uh, Saturday. Uh, it was a combination between our church and the YMCA. And we had 2,500 people show up. Uh, and most of those kids, of course. Good thing we spent a lot of money on candy before we showed up. <laughs> that was a lot of a lot of kids, a lot of kids. Okay, um, let's see, Pam says you're home now for the live stream. Yay! Uh, just all in one resource says it's amazing what happens when you donate your body for science. Believe me, a lot of bodies are not used for science. I was actually talking to somebody about that the other day. Somebody who actually works in that uh, in that industry, um, and they said, you know, you you can be more specific as to who you donate your body to or what you donate it for. Um, if you just say donate to science, you never know what's going to happen to your body. So Jeffrey Schuler says, why not $6,000? Why not? Please give. Well, I'll take $6,000 for our Overcoming the Darkness campaign. I didn't put the 6000 in just because I didn't want to stretch it too far. Plus, I love getting over the goal if possible, which we have done, but we still could use your, your, uh, your donations. Uh, CWL says the company I work for used to put out a Halloween skeleton until we found out it was a real life skeleton and we don't decorate for Halloween anymore. <laughs> so one little error like that and suddenly you don't decorate for Halloween anymore. Just one corpse you find sometime and oh, that takes all the fun out of Halloween. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um Zark says, Heather O'Rourke used to live in my town. Mary's Donuts here has pictures of most of their customers, and one is Heather. Interesting. Okay. Um, Steph says, I love the haunted movie set stories. Good. I'm glad you like that. Thank you. Um, Just All in One comes back saying, I've watched the documentary on this. They are strange. It also goes for another movie called The Exorcist. They were just as strange. Yes. Yeah, there are. Uh, there's, there's stories about The Exorcist being cursed as well. Well, so now that we've covered the Halloween decorations and props that turned out to be actual corpses, let's flip that around and look at real people who somehow became corpses at Halloween haunted houses and attractions. In September 2017, a 21-year-old man named Chung died after he was struck with a moving piece of machinery in a haunted house. Chung made his way through a maze called Buried Alive, which was part of a Halloween-themed fest at Ocean Park in Hong Kong. Five minutes after entering, park attendants found Chung unconscious in the maze. The local government he, uh, believes that he entered into an area for mechanical operations that was not open to visitors and was hit by a mechanical part. Chung was pronounced dead at the hospital. The government ordered the ride to close after that fatal accident. In September 1957, in the small farming community of Utica, Kansas, local parents and school officials were growing worried about the extent to which high school seniors were hazing the incoming freshmen. Annual gymnasium parties commemorating the new pupils had resulted in too much roughhousing, so English teacher Betty Stevens and Principal William Hobart Sally devised something different for their students. Mrs. Stevens led her charges to an abandoned farmhouse a couple miles outside of town. She and some other school staff had decorated the dilapidated home as a haunted house for a pre-Halloween party. The centerpiece was Principal Sally, who would pretend to be hanging in the middle of a dark room, covered in grease paint and ketchup to simulate blood. Well, you know what happened. The students did indeed get a kick out of the moaning, limply hanging principal, but when Mr. Stevens slipped out of the party to get a picture of Sally, she made a shocking discovery. He had slipped, causing the noose to tighten on his neck. The moaning and struggling, the principal, well, he had not been acting at all. The students actually witnessed the slow, painful, strangling death of Mr. Sally. In October of 2014, 16-year-old Christian Faith Bang visited Land of Illusion Haunted Screen Park in Middleton, Ohio, 
a seasonal Halloween attraction where her father's band was supposed to perform that night. Bang entered one of the haunted attractions and collapsed. She was given CPR by her mother and paramedics, but Bang succumbed to a fatal heart attack. Bang only had one lung, and this put significant stress on her heart. The county coroner's office would later speculate that fear might have exacerbated the teen's fatal condition. In October of 1990, the 17-year-old Brian Jewell was working at a Lakewood, New Jersey haunted hayride, performing a stunt that he had done several times before. In the act, Jewell would simulate hanging himself with a fake noose by stepping off of a platform about one foot off the ground. That night, though, the noose, which was designed to not tighten, inexplicably did, choking and killing Jewel when he stepped off the platform. About 40 people unwittingly saw a real hanging corpse as the tractor driver became concerned later when it dawned on him that Jewel had not been delivering his usual scripted speech. On Halloween night in 2016, in the small town of Chunky, Massachusetts, a haunted hayride ended in a fatal disaster. The modest ride, holding just 10 guests, was moving along the rural Mississippi countryside when, uh, did I say Chunky, Massachusetts? I meant Chunky, Mississippi. But uh, he was moving along the rural Mississippi countryside, this, uh, this hayride, when tragedy struck. A large Ford F-150 pickup truck collided with the trailer carrying the people. Three passengers were tragically killed. The rest were injured. Phantom Manor, the haunted house ride at Disneyland Paris, is designed to offer its guests a frightful but harmlessly fun experience. It's a heavily visited mystery-based amusement ride at the park. In April 2016, however, Disney cast and crew members made a grisly discovery at Phantom Manor. A 45-year-old technician was found electrocuted to death. Disney closed the ride, allowing the police to perform a proper investigation. All right, so um, let's check some more of those comments. See how see how those are coming in. We've got uh, Jenny saying Happy Halloween, everybody. Um, Pam says, Does Chunky Mississippi make anybody else think of the candy bar? That's exactly what I thought of. <laughs> exactly what I thought of. <laughs> uh, Janine says Rockport, Texas, where the Hurricane Harvey went through. Um, let's see here. Uh, Janine also says, don't know who won since the stream went down. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not going to do any more videos. Uh, that's just that's just too much of a hassle. Uh, but Paul Tubbs was our last our last victim. Uh, Paul Tubbs, um, if you were if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook and it went down for you, sorry about that. Um, but Paul Tubbs, uh, you have until the end of tonight to uh, to email me so you can win your price back. Vincent says, where are you guys at? I'm in East Central Florida. Well. Uh, let it let him know in the in the YouTube comments. Let him know where you are. Me, I'm in Loves Park, Illinois. Uh, let's see here. Um, Tim says, "I hope that hope YouTube doesn't do that again." Well, it's not going to if I don't play any more videos. So I will keep this in mind for next year. I'm really sorry, folks. I had so much fun videos that I wanted to share with you guys tonight, and it just well, it just YouTube. What do you expect? Uh, Nicole says, put weird darkness on while doing Halloween hair and makeup, and all my clients love it. Well, thank you, Nicole. I appreciate that. So you're one of our weird at work people. Uh, if you have people listening at work with you, be sure to uh, be sure to register for my monthly weird at work contest. You can do that on the contest page at weirddarkness.com. And if you don't win this month, then just re-register for next month and keep doing it until you do win.
On the day before Halloween in 1948, a Saturday in the early afternoon, the Denora, Pennsylvania high school football team was defeated on its own home turf, Legion Field, by local rival Monongahela Monon, Monon, High School. There you go, Monongahela. Wow. I even practiced that before tonight and I still didn't get it right. Anyway, the final score was Monongahela 27, Denora 7. Not a single pass was thrown during the entire game by either team, but there was something far more odd, sinister, and tragic than erratic play on the gridiron that both literally and figuratively overshadowed the field and the 150 or so players and spectators who had gathered together that afternoon at Legion Field in the suburb of Western Pennsylvania. It was the smog. Speaking 60 years later, in 2008, to reporters from the Pittsburgh Gazette, local resident Sam Jackson, who played in the football game for Monongahela High School, remembered the smog was like a big cloud of yellowish mist hanging over the players. Lenora resident Paul Brown, who had left work early from the U.S. Steel Company mill where he worked on Saturday, October 30th, 1948, in order to attend the football game, told reporters it took a while to get up the hill to the game because it was so foggy. I was sitting in the fourth row. You could see them punt the ball, hear them kick it, but it just disappear into the clouds. The Denora smog, what the New York Times has since called one of the worst air pollution disasters in our nation's history, affected much more than just a high school football game in suburban Pennsylvania. Before all was said and done, what became known as the Denora smog, which began October 27, 1948, and did not lift for more than four full days, finally dissipated sometime the evening of Halloween, October 31st. It would directly claim the lives of 20 people. Over 5,000 residents of Denora, Pennsylvania, out of a total of approximately 14,000, would become sick with everything ranging from upper respiratory infections and bronchitis to nausea and vomiting over the course of this four-day smog. The smog first began to settle over Denora, a suburb roughly 30 miles south of Pittsburgh, during the afternoon of Wednesday, October 27, 1948, right when most of the townspeople were outside and lining the main street to watch all the town's school children march by in costumes for Denora's annual Children's Halloween Parade. The yellow smog settled over Denora at the start of the long Halloween weekend, and it stayed in place like a yellow smokescreen for the next 96 hours. At its height, on the night of October 30th and the morning of October 31st, residents described the Denora smog as an impenetrable yellow haze. Driving became impossible, and even walking around in public proved hazardous. The first death from the smog occurred in the local Denora Hospital at just after 2 a.m. in the morning on Saturday, October 30th, 1948. Over the course of the next 36 hours, 19 more residents of Denora and the neighboring town of Webster would die as a direct result of the smog. All the victims died from the onset of acute asthma or the inability to breathe, a sort of yellow smog-induced asphyxiation, and all of those who died in the immediate presence of the smog were either elderly or young children. Hospitals in the area filled to capacity and many were turned away during the Denora smog disaster. Residents were advised to flee the town and outlying areas during the height of the smog by the local authorities via message broadcasts over the radios. But as driving was impossible, these advisories simply couldn't be heeded by anyone. By Halloween night, Sunday, October 31st, 1948, the local funeral parlor had run out of caskets for sale. Phone calls flooded into doctor's offices reporting various respiratory problems and difficulty breathing. One brave soul, Dr. William Ronagus, uh, carried a lantern through the streets of Denora and led ambulances through the town on foot so that medical personnel could reach the most severely ill victims of the smog and transport them to the hospital where they could receive life-saving oxygen. On Halloween 1948, there was no surprise to speak of in Denora, Pennsylvania, or no sunrise, that is, to speak of in Denora, Pennsylvania. The town was caught in the grips of a monstrous yellow smog and the numbers of dead and dying were mounting even higher. Then, almost miraculously, before the sun was due to set that Halloween, the smog suddenly lifted. As Dr. Ronagus, who had battled the effects of the smog on foot the whole time, 
told reporters the day after the disaster ended, if the fog hadn't lifted when it did, the casualty list would have been a thousand or maybe more. Located 30 miles south of Pittsburgh, on the banks of the Monongahela River prior to the 20th century, uh, prior to the 20th century, Denora, Pennsylvania, had been a small, quiet, and rural farming community nestled in a valley of the Appalachian Mountains, with 400-foot-high cliffs rising up on both sides of the town. However, in 1902, as Andrew Carnegie owned steel, uh, uh, and let me try that again. However, in 1902, an Andrew Carnegie owned steel factory, a factory for the United States Steel Company, known the world over as the famous U.S. Steel, opened in the valley right outside of the Nora. The U.S. Steel Factory brought jobs, middle-class affluence, and more and more residents to the once rural valley of the Nora, Pennsylvania. By 1908, only six years after the factory's opening, Denora was home to the largest concentration of railroad freight traffic in the eastern United States. And then in 1915, a zinc mining works, known to locals as the Zinc Plant, opened up in Denora, right next to Carnegie's U.S. Steel Factory. With steel fires burning, hazardous zinc mining production tons, uh, pr uh, producing tons of toxic waste and pollutants and grotesquely high carbon monoxide emissions from the highly concentrated freight trains of Denora, Officials from the federal government realized early on that air pollution in and around Denora could pose a dangerous a danger to public health. Consequently, in 1918, the American Steel and Wire Company of Denora was fined by the federal government for excessive air pollution at a time when such fines were all but unheard of. However, the fine was paid and no corrective action was ever pursued. During the 1920s, Local farmers had brought class action suits against U.S. Steel due to the loss of crops and sickness caused to their, to their livestock as a result of the pollution caused by the steelworks and the nearby zinc plant. But U.S. Steel was able to fight off the suits in court, and plans to upgrade the zinc work furnaces in order to have them produce less smoke were never implemented by 1948. Given the higher rate of pollutants, especially metallic part uh, particulate matter in the air above the Nora in late October 1948, conditions were more than right for one of America's history's, uh, American history's worst environmental disasters. The American Steel and Wire Plant and the Denora Zinc Works emitted a deadly combination of poisonous gases and highly toxic particulate matter into the air. And in October of 1948, all of those toxins became trapped in the sky just above Denora as a result of a most unfortunate and peculiar weather event called a temperature inversion. A temperature inversion is when cold air is trapped in a bubble by a layer of warmer air that settles above it, causing the cold air beneath to become stagnant and still. In the case of the Denora smog disaster, this bubble, filled with metallic toxins, poisonous gases, and the form of a yellow smoke cloud, became trapped above the town for four whole days as it settled down into the valley and had nowhere else to go. To the residents of Denora, Pennsylvania, it simply became a yellow cloud of suffocation and death. Author, historian, and environmental activist Deborah Davis, in her work entitled When Smoke Ran Like Water, Tales of Environmental Deception and the Battle Against Pollution, wrote of the victims of the Denora smog disaster that if you looked at the x-rays of their lungs, they looked like the, survivor, uh, the survivors of poison gas warfare. Even a full decade after the smog disaster, government investigators working on behalf of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania found that the early mortality rate and incidence of chronic respiratory illness among residents of Denora was twice that of residents from other nearby communities. Denora, uh, the average house price in Denora dropped by more than 10% within a year of the disaster. But at the time of the smog disaster, the vast majority of Denora's 14,000 plus residents were employed either by the steel plant or the zinc works, and these industries were the economic lifeblood of the community. Loyalty to the mills was ingrained almost from birth into the minds of those who lived in Denora. As Ms. Davis states in her work on the subject, the majority of the town worked in the mills. Any suggestion that there could be a problem with the mill itself, which was supporting them financially, was simply something that they could not entertain. So much so that it was reported in newspapers around the country that the first state government investigators sent to Denora to look into the smog disaster in November of 1948 were literally run out of town by people armed with handguns. 
However, in conjunction with the state of Pennsylvania, by the end of 1948, an investigation was launched by the newly formed United States Public Health Service into the causes and results of the smog disaster. In total, 25 federal investigators were sent to Denora and the neighboring town of Webster to look into the disaster. While there, government investigators interviewed residents, inspected crops, drew blood from the livestock, and took countless air samples in and around Denora. The federal government's official report on the Denora smog disaster was issued in October of 1949, almost exactly a year to the day of the suffocating yellow clouds onset. In their report, the United States Public Health Service found that out of a total population of just over 14,000 individuals, no less than 5,000 residents of the Nora had either died or become seriously ill as a result of the smog disaster. Rather, instead of directly blaming the air pollution itself, the government report, a report blamed the relatively rare weather phenomenon on a temperature inversion and the high cliffs that surround the town of the Nora as being the primary causes behind the smog disaster of Halloween weekend 1948. Despite the federal government's reticence to overly or to overtly blame heavy metal production and air pollution itself for causing the Denora smog disaster of 1948, the incident did gain nationwide media exposure throughout the United States. And for really the first time in American history, Americans began to take a serious look at the harmful effects of air pollution on our rapidly urbanizing nation. One article entitled simply, The Fog, published in The New Yorker in 1950 and written by celebrated medical journalist Burton Roche, was read by millions and brought home to many Americans the depth of the suffering experienced by the residents of Denora as a result of air pollution. Soon, a nascent clean air movement, which preached against the harmful effects of air pollution on people's health and well-being, began to spread and grow across the nation. For the first time in history, as a direct result of the Denora smog disaster of 1948, Americans realized that short-term exposure to large amounts of toxins and pollutants could have a harmful or even fatal effect on otherwise healthy people. In 1963, 15 years after the Denora smog disaster, Congress passed the Clean Air Act, which required that the United States develop and enforce federal regulations to help protect the general public from exposure to harmful amounts of airborne toxins and pollutants, just like those that had caused the Denora smog disaster. For nearly 60 years, no one talked much about the Denora smog disaster. Perhaps the memories of that suffocating yellow haze that enveloped their town for four days and its deadly grasp were just too traumatic for many of the town's aging and elderly residents who could still remember, uh, who could still remember it to speak about it. But then on the 60th anniversary of the disaster, the memories of those who died and all those who suffered during the Denora Smog Disaster were forever immortalized when the town opened the Denora Smog Museum on the banks of the Monongahala River. And today that museum stands as a small and silent reminder to all who walk by of a terrifying yellow haze that descended on a small Pennsylvania town in October 1948. And it ended up changing the way we Americans viewed our world forever. All right. So let's uh, let's go back and check some of the comments that have been coming in. Um, somebody uh, just all in one resource says you might want to look into doing the Roku thing. Um, I could, but I, I do this so I do this so rarely I don't, I don't think it would be worth looking into it um rob says that's a long story <laughs> sorry rob um let's see here uh zark says i still want to visit Cent uh, centralia sometime yes centralia pennsylvania the inspiration at least some people believe the inspiration for the the video game silent hill uh sean gibson says i'll definitely work on this story for the weekend to turn it into darren thank you sean yes Please send me your story. Um, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. Joshua says, thanks for all that you do, but I was watching on Facebook and now it's telling me that you are not live anymore, so YouTube it is. Dang, have it. Sorry. All right. Well, you know, that that happens. Uh, Jeffrey says, my son keeps telling me to post this, so I hope you read it. Braylon, my son, is watching with me. He loves the micro terrors. 
He wants to wish you a happy Halloween and a happy birthday. Well, thank you very much, Jeffrey. I, I appreciate it. Uh, folks, give me, give me two seconds. I got to do something real quick and I will be right back. P break. Uh, can you do a P break in 60 seconds? I can't. <laughs> I just had to talk to my bride for a couple of seconds and also get a and grab a, a drink of my weird dark roast coffee with pumpkin spice creamer. Um, okay. Anyway, um, let's see here. I like the short pauses. Um, okay. Actually, I think we I think we've covered it. single word I knew our love was right I felt her hot breath get near when she nibbled on my ear then I saw her face come into the light She's my werewolf girlfriend, it was love at first bite. She's my werewolf girlfriend, she's only dangerous at night. She's still a fox to me, even though she has lycanthropy. My werewolf girlfriend and me. Every month. She has her womanly change But instead of getting grumpy She suffers from the mange I don't need to buy her furs The best in the world is already hers Her manicures are out of my price range She's my werewolf girlfriend It was love at first bite My werewolf girlfriend She's only dangerous at night Ooh, she's still a fox to me even though she has lycanthropy My werewolf girlfriend And me It's very dangerous when we fight She 
It's really strange when we kiss goodnight. To be the leader of my pack, I need more hair on my back. She's allergic to silver, so I buy her gold. I know she's healthy when her nose is cold. I know our love will never fail when she starts to wag her tail. Waiting by the door when I get home. Oh, she's my werewolf girlfriend. It was love at first bite. My werewolf girlfriend, she's only dangerous at night. Ooh, she's still a fox to me, even though she has lycanthropy. My werewolf girlfriend and me. My werewolf girlfriend and me. Okay, you guys seem to have a lot of fun with that one. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at all the comments that are coming in, <laughs> and uh, you you uh, you like that. So that's yeah. I, I love I love the one uh, somebody said. Take that. Where is it here? Um, yeah, there you go. Take that, YouTube. It's a Darren original. <laughs> Thank you, Janine. I appreciate that. Um, by the way, I've stopped the video for the doorbell because uh, trick or treat hours are over here in uh, loves park illinois so there's no sense in in continuing that so all right let me let me sh share just some of the comments that came in though during that song before i tell you our new winner uh let's see here um zark said lol uh dd says lol new favorite song vincent gave me a couple of thumbs up um i love uh see you master see you online I love Werewolf Girlfriend. I hope you share it as a YouTube short so I can share it with others. Um, I am going to be sharing it on YouTube. Uh, I think it's it's ready to um, ready to post uh, after the show tonight. I think it's going to post sometime later tonight or early, early tomorrow. So it'll be there as a video. It's not going to be a short. It'll just be a, a straight video. But uh, there you go. Uh, Zark said, still a fox to me, even though she has lycanthropy. Thank you. I, I um Vincent says, great song. Tim Petty says, this is the best song I've ever heard. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not going to take that at face value, Tim, but thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey says, you need to upload the video onto YouTube by itself. Yep, that's, that. I will be doing that. I'll double check on that as soon as the show's over, um, just to make sure that it is set. Um, and I also apologize for the singing on that. I know some of you um, said that it was, it was good, but... That was just a one take type of thing. I, I just had to sit here in front. I couldn't hear myself. The, uh, the the way I've got things set up here in the studio, I cannot sing and listen to music at the same time while recording. And so I had to put one headphone on my ear and the other one, I was one headphone on my ear to listen to the music and then um, speak here. And I had a completely separate device playing the music. Um, and then I had to put them together later. And it's it was... It was a, it was a mess, but anyway, um, and I haven't sung in not professionally in years, uh, that because I stopped singing many years ago. Uh, it's a long drawn out story, but essentially, I, I I abused my voice. I wasn't singing properly, but on the plus side, I ended up getting the voice for voiceovers. So uh, so it's not really a bad thing, um, but. You can you can tell that singing is not my forte anymore, but I still enjoy putting it together. Okay, uh, continuing on here. Um, let's see. Uh, 
Vincent said, really good singing voice there and kind of Bruce Springsteen sounding. You know, I hadn't really thought about that. That does kind of have a, a Bruce Springsteen sound to it. Um, uh, Dan wants to know, is that Zach Wild? Uh, no, it's Darren Marlar. I'm, I'm the one that's saying that one. I, I wrote the song, uh, the lyrics, the melody, I sang it, and then I hired someone to, to, to uh, put the music behind it, and they have to stay anonymous for professional reasons, but they did a great job with it. Uh, let's see, Vincent says, yeah, 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 need more songs from him. Are you playing the guitar, Darren? No, that wasn't me. Uh, Michelle's giving me a, a standing ovation there. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Seal wants me to put it on YouTube. I will do that again. Uh, Michaela says the song is my new fave. Thank you, Michaela. Um, Michaela's somewhat biased. I've, I've adopted her as my little sister, but still. Uh, Kyle says, awesome song. Didi says, that was beautiful. Nick says, great song. Raina says, love it. Um, Gus said that part about mange made me snort my coffee. <laughs> uh, Vincent says it's pronounced Yanacone. Yanacone. I have no idea what you're referring to. Like, Yanacone? I have, I have no idea. Isabel says, very uh, Springsteen-esque. Steve says, uh, all I said was hi, Darren. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So that, that's it for those. That graphic uh, in the bag actually works pretty well because we're getting ready to talk about Halloween candy. Oh, Halloween. You're, you're nothing like the original holiday, are you? No, that, that's okay. I mean, thanks to our socioeconomic ideologies, we found several ways to capitalize on Halloween and enhance the absolute best parts of it all. You know, that mass consumption of candy. There's nothing like knocking on people's doors, asking for candy, and coming home with a full pillowcase or basket of those sugary treats. And we all know that there's this unspoken hierarchy to Halloween candy as well. I mean, there's the good stuff. There's the king size Snickers, the Reese's peanut butter cups, full size bags of M&Ms. You got the candy bars that you're willing to trade though. You know, maybe that Three Musketeers bar for that Milky Way. And don't forget the candy that you give to your younger brother because he doesn't know the difference between a delicious Reese's and one of those disgusting little pumpkin shaped candies. And then there's the candy uh, that your parents suspect has been tampered with. Though we'd rather enjoy our candy without fear that someone has done something malicious to it, we can't. Not anymore. There are some creeps out there who delight in doing it nowadays. For decades, parents have worried about the possibility of their children eating a piece of Halloween candy laced with drugs or filled with needles. In 1983, Chicago Sun-Times advice columnist Ann Landers, she even wrote a piece about this, warning readers that... In recent years, there have been reports of people with twisted minds putting razor blades and poison and taffy apples in Halloween candy. That said, some skeptics write the idea off as an urban legend, except for that story that I shared earlier in this episode. And there have certainly been false reports and exaggerated stories of tainted candy, but there have been a number of shocking and even deadly stories of poisoned Halloween candy dating back to the 1950s, despite the story that I shared earlier. These are some of the real stories that led, that uh, contributed to the collective fear that kids might bring home more than candy when they go out trick-or-treating. There's the original Candyman. Meet William V. Shine, a quiet dentist from Fremont, California. On Halloween 1959, he handed out 450 pieces of candy to trick-or-treaters that happened to be heart-shaped candy-coated laxatives. Nobody knows why he did this, but if it was, if he was out to make the kids sick, well, he succeeded. 30 kids fell ill. Parents traced the candy back to the man living at 4844 Norris Road, and it was none other than Shine himself. When Shine found out the police were looking for him, he skipped town. Police arrested his good friend Hazel Engleby, who was handing out candy with him that night, though. Shine eventually turned himself in on November 11th, and he was charged with unlawful dispensing of drugs, and outrage of public decency. The court dropped the drug dispensing charges and let Angleby off the hook. Shine, however, still faced a $500 fine and spent six months behind bars. A few years later, he was arrested again, this time for insurance fraud, and he spent two months in county jail. 
Shine passed away in 2007, but he left a legacy of laced Halloween candy that would haunt us to this day. In 1968, the New York Times reported 13 cases of children in New Jersey finding razor blades in apples that they received while trick-or-treating. Now, in 75% of these cases, the children were uninjured. However, fear of these razor blade apples was so strong, the state passed a law to criminalize tampering with Halloween candy. Despite the public reaction to these events, two detailed studies of the cases conducted in 1972 and 1982 determined nearly all the claims were false, and the children had put the razors in the apples themselves to propagate the urban legend. But not every single instance was written off as a hoax. That's It's bad enough eating milk duds um, that, that they get stuck to your molars, but finding bullets where your candy is supposed to be, that's probably worse. Back in 2014, a mother from Ohio discovered bullets in her four-year-old son's box of milk duds. And what made this an even more troublesome discovery was that her son's preschool had handed them out during a trick-or-treat event. And these were certainly not milk duds, nor were they duds, if you know what I mean about bullets. These were live rounds, all 22 caliber. Now, the school, they didn't have anything to tell the press about this incident. They were not the ones who brought in the bullet-filled candy boxes. I would hope not. Parents brought in the candy from home, which means that this is either a sick prank or a really scary message. And whatever the case, it was not a mistake. After trick-or-treating in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, in 2015, a boy began biting into a Snickers bar but stopped when something just didn't feel right. That something turned out to be a disposable razor, which was shoved into the nougat. Police believed the incident was isolated, but named no suspects. States, one by one, are, are legalizing marijuana for recreational use. But before the prohibition on pot was lifted, people had to resort to some clever ways of transferring drugs from dealer to dealer, or for, excuse me, from dealer to user. And one dealer from Hercules, California, thought of the perfect plan. Transport his drugs in Snickers candy bar wrappers. Great idea! Uh, unfortunately, if you're attempting to mail said marijuana, totaling five ounces, and you get the address of the postage wrong, your plan can backfire. Call this one unintentional, but any mysterious appearance of drugs in an edible substance is creepy. As the letter was left stranded at the post office, the worker decided to hand out the Snickers bars to the kids. And that's how four weed Snickers bars ended up in somebody's trick-or-treat bag. Police noted that the Snickers bars were so perfectly resealed, anyone could have mistaken the candy for actual candy. Nobody did, though, obviously. When you opened the wrapper, you found marijuana butts wrapped tightly in a plastic baggie. And I'm pretty sure that doesn't smell like chocolate smells like skunk. Anyway, the post office worker was not charged for being an unintentional drug dealer to minors. The Halloween 2015 incident involved an 11-year-old girl in Toronto who bit into a chocolate bar only to find a razor blade inside. She was the third child in the city to find a sharp object in her Halloween candy that year. Children in the city's Upper Beaches area found a needle and a thumbtack lodged inside their candy. Fortunately, none of the children were harmed. Another 2014 Halloween candy horror story, a young boy from Spokane, Washington, found a rusty nail in his Halloween candy, but it's not like he was pulling apart his candy. No, Halloween candy is not an arts and crafts project. He was eating it. Yes, he bit down on the nail, and yes, it poked his cheek. Fortunately, he was not seriously injured, and he did get a tetanus shot just to be safe. However, I'd personally be terrified of biting into a piece of candy from then on. The mother of the young boy's friend proceeded to open up the rest of his trick-or-treat candy and found several other pieces of metal inside them. That included nails, staples, and what looked to be watch parts. So what's the deal with razors? Well, in 2013, a 12-year-old Pennsylvania boy opened a miniature bag of M&Ms to discover a one-inch disposable razor in there. Oddly enough, the package didn't show any signs of tampering. The boy was not able to pinpoint which house the candy came from because, according to him, every other house, I think I got a pack of M&Ms. 
In 2015, a Tucson, Arizona mom found a bottle of Dramamine in her five-year-old daughter's candy bag. The bottle was open and contained six pills. While the substance is safe for adults to take when experiencing motion sickness, it can reportedly cause hallucinations and seizures in children. The girl's mother had not noticed the Dramamine at first. Fortunately, it was caught before the child in ingested any of the pills. Trick-or-treating is for kids. Maybe high school teenagers, but definitely for kids. So when we see that person who looks questionably too old to be trick-or-treating, part of us has a tendency to judge them, don't we? I mean, how dare they take the candy away from the children? But you know, it's not like we ever do anything about it. Unless you're Helen File. Helen File had been passing out candy to young kids all day, but when she started seeing people who were too old to be trick-or-treating, in her opinion, the 14 to 16-year-olds, she got a little too wrapped up in a practical joke. File took out a dog biscuit, some steel wool, and ant buttons, which is ant trap poison, and wrapped it up like a candy bar and then handed it out to a total of 12 teenagers. Five of the candies were discovered that evening. When confronted by police, she swore she meant it as a joke. There was supposed to be nothing malicious about it. But the judge had her admitted to a hospital for a psychological examination. He states that he didn't understand how someone with reason could poison children as a joke. In 2018, two children trick-or-treating in Marshfield, Massachusetts found sewing needles hidden within their Twizzlers candy. That same Halloween, a mother in Tennessee also reported finding a sewing needle in her child's candy. None of the children were injured, but Marshfield police did tell everybody to throw out all the Twizzlers candy just to be safe. Personally, I, I say throw out the Twizzlers anyway because licorice. Ew. Uh, now, your candy is not yours. We've all heard about the parent tax. Yeah, your, your candy is not yours until your parents sift through it first. That's just how it goes. They reach in, look for the best stuff, and take it. That's the mommy and daddy tax, the parent tax. Well, Salinas, California, 2013, a mom was eating some of her daughter's trick-or-treat candy when she started to feel some curious side effects. It started as anxiety and then quickly changed to euphoria. After feeling ill, she checked the candy wrapper for its ingredients, and she noticed a small hole in the wrapper that shouldn't be there. I mean, holes in wrappers aren't there not supposed to be. She checked herself into the hospital and the doctor told her she was tripping on LSD. The woman didn't suffer any long-term side effects following the incident, but had that been her daughter, that may have been another story. The lesson here is to always let your parents take the Halloween candy tax because they double as a taste tester. After a fun Halloween night in Lloydminster, Canada, two children found pills in their candy. One had a full blister pack of pills. The other found an individual pill after biting into a Snickers bar. Though reports didn't include what kind of pill it was, its markings, APO, indicated that it was a prescription of some kind. When the parents looked at the Snickers wrapper, it was evident somebody had tampered with it. Two children who lived just two blocks, um, excuse, <clears throat> excuse me, two children who lived just two blocks away from each other in Manistee, Michigan, both found razor blades in their candy while trick-or-treating in 2015. A pack of Laffy Taffy and a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup both contained small razors similar to what would be found in a portable pencil sharpener. The local police chief referred, to the incidents, uh, referred them to the incidents as a new level of rottenness. Fortunately, neither child was injured. Halloween candy, it just it tastes so good. But the ingredients that go into a, the candy, not so good. Uh, we're, I'm not talking about the, the caramel, the chocolate, or even the high fructose corn syrup, because that's all good stuff. I'm talking about far worse ingredients. If you were given instructions to make some of your favorite Halloween candy, it might include a preservative, TBHQ. TBHQ, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, is a byproduct of butane. It's essentially lighter fluid. The substance antioxidant properties are great for preventing the, the discoloration of candy that contains iron, but kind of makes you wonder, I mean, if you eat too much Halloween candy, are you a candidate for spontaneous human combustion? And in 2018, a couple reported feeling ill after ingesting their parent tax of Halloween candy. 
The Sour Patch Kids had seemed fine before they opened the package, but it was obvious that they were not fine. The candy ended up testing positive for meth. Thank goodness their kids didn't need any of it. Score another point for the parent tax on Halloween candy. And James Joseph Smith of Minneapolis. He's known for handing out Snickers bars to local children that he had filled with needles. What a guy. His crime did not result in any fatalities, but one teenage boy was pricked by a needle when biting into the candy. Smith was later charged with one count of adulterating a substance with intent to cause death, harm, or illness. All right, let's do another giveaway. How about that? Hmm? Hmm? No, no, you know what? Let's check the comments first. We'll check the comments, and then we'll do another giveaway. All right, let's see here. Doing the comments. Uh, OMG, dragon stuff and candy. What? Dragons. All right. My dad collected, yep, called it the candy tax. Yep, that's exactly what it was. Uh, Seal says, what's wrong with people in this world? I know. I, I don't understand it either. Uh, Jeffrey says, loved your, your reading of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Ah, listened to it the other day. You and James Earl Jones reading uh, on The Simpsons are 1A <laughs> and 1B. You know what? If I'm going to come in second place to James Earl Jones, that's I'll take that count. That's a compliment. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Dee Dee says, worst thing I got was a notebook and stickers from a teacher. Uh, let's see. Um, what else have we got in here? Um, Rebecca is just logging into the Halloween live stream. Love this tradition. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm, I'm enjoying it, too. Uh, just all in one resource. He's been posting a lot tonight. Says, I had my brother make popsicles for me and him. After a few seconds, it seems that he put soap into mine. What a taste. But that isn't as bad as me putting or, uh, or gel on my sister's toothbrush. That's just mean, man. That, that That's just wrong. That's wrong. Um, Ike says, how come you're not doing the live stream on your lawn? Um, well... I did that the very first year. Um, actually, I think I did that two years in a row. Um, and then one year, the, the weather didn't cooperate. And so we had to move it indoors. Um, and then I discovered StreamYard, which is what I'm using to, to do all of the graphics here, to look at all the comments, um, play the different videos and stuff. And I really liked the way this worked. And I can't really do this outside very well. Uh, so I'm just... Just doing it indoors. It's just, a, it's a lot easier for me. And I've got a cat in here. How did you get in here? Yeah, meow. How did you get in here? I know. Miss Mocha Monster is in here. You want, you want to come up here? You want to say hi to everybody? I know, I know. I know, you don't like it. I just want to show you everybody. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. It's Miss Mocha Monster. Miss Mocha Monster, say meow. Say meow. Say meow. Meow, meow, meow. She hates being picked up. All right, I'm letting you down. She didn't scratch me, but she hates being picked up. Um, uh, Seal says, nice name. Uh, yeah, actually, it's uh, it started off as Mocha. We, we got the cat, and we just called her Mocha. Oh, excuse me, I called her Mocha. And then Robin said, oh, no, 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 Miss, we're going to add Miss to it, Miss Mocha. And I said, okay, fine. But then we got into her personality and realized Miss Mocha Monster is probably a lot, a lot more accurate. So, okay, there we go. All right, I need to take a real, real quick break and let the cat out. Um, I, think, I think Robin came in here. She gave me this big bag of candy. This is all the candy that we had left. Goodness gracious, we got Tootsie Rolls, Mounds, Mr. Good Bars. Suckers, paydays. Wow. Okay. Anyway, we're gonna be at that for a while. Yeah, that's that's great for the for the figure. All right. But anyway, I'm gonna take a real quick break so I can let the cat out, and I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, that one. All right. Halloween crimes. They're usually thought of as the thoughtless mayhem of demented strangers who enjoy poisoning candy or putting razor blades in apples. But crimes committed on Halloween are much more serious and more real than those urban legends. 
There have been numerous murders, kidnappings, and assaults that have taken place on October 31st, and many are directly related to the festivities of the holiday. And while it remains debatable as to whether or not there is a spike in crime on Halloween, there is no debate that all these particular assaults happened in connection with the holiday. Many of these crimes I'm about to tell you about have been carried out by people who took advantage of the occasion to wear a costume and fool their victims for just long enough to kill them. Others involve people out trick-or-treating or returning from parties late at night, but as with most violent crime in general, crimes that happen on Halloween are usually committed either by somebody known to the victim or in case of mistaken identity. In a few cases, the crime has never been solved, and years or even decades have gone by with no closure for the loved ones of the victims. So here are some true stories of the worst crimes ever committed in connection with Halloween. Late Halloween Night, 2004. Roommates Leslie Mazzara and Adrian Insonia went to bed after handing out candy. A third roommate, Lauren Mianza, was woken up at 1 a.m. by the sounds of a scuffle. Not knowing what was happening, she ran in terror from the house. When the coast was clear, she ran back upstairs and found both of her roommates dead. Throughout the investigation, FBI agents found cigarette butts near the scene of the crime that matched blood evidence inside the house, but found no known matches in any DNA databases. Officers and FBI agents spoke to nearly a thousand people of interest during the investigation, including one of Insonia's friends, Lily Pudholm. Her husband, Eric Koppel, became a person of interest during the investigation when he began avoiding the police. Nearly a year after the crime, Koppel turned himself in and confessed to the crime. At the time of the crime, Koppel was only engaged to the friend of one of his victims and carried on with the wedding, thinking that he was in the clear. This quote from Adrian and Sonia's mother, Arlene Allen, gives a chilling insight into a slayer who thought he got away with it. She said, You are the man who was so cruel as to invite me, the mother of the woman you murdered, to stand up for you at your wedding, to read scripture to you of love and death, and to bless your union. On Halloween 2010, Ohio teenager Devin Griffin returned home from Sunday church services to find his brother Derek, mother Susan, and Susan's new husband, William Lisk, murdered. Devin was so traumatized he could only say that the scene was like something out of a haunted house. The culprit was found to be William Lisk's son from a previous marriage. William Lisk Jr., who had a history of schizophrenia and aggression. Lisk was later picked up and pleaded guilty to all three murders. He took his own life in prison in 2015. Bronx resident Carl Jackson was a 21-year-old data entry clerk at Morgan Stanley. On Halloween night 1998, Jackson went with his girlfriend to pick up her young son from a party. While there, some teenagers threw eggs at their car, but the Halloween prank soon turned ugly. Jackson got out of his car, exchanged words with the teens, and then got back in the car. Then one of the teens pulled out a sidearm and shot Jackson ending his life instantly. Police later arrested 17-year-old Curtis Sterling for the crime. In 2009, three teenage girls were abducted by a man on their way home from trick-or-treating in Woodbridge, Virginia. All three were taken at gunpoint to a wooded area, and two were sexually assaulted. The third girl was able to call her mother, causing the man to flee. Police arrested Aaron Thomas, who was already a suspect in numerous sexual assault cases since the 1990s. Thomas pled guilty to the crime in 2012. Yoshihiro Hattori, which I believe we spoke about earlier, was a Japanese exchange student living in Baton Rouge as part of the American Field Service program. On Halloween night 1992, Hattori and the young son of his host family went to a Halloween party for American Field Service students. Unfamiliar with the neighborhood where the party was, the boy rang the doorbell of the wrong house. When they got no answer, they started walking back to their car. The owner of the home, Rodney Pears, then opened the door armed with a 44 Magnum. A Tory turned around and said, we're here for the party, claiming that he feared for his life and that the exchange student was scary. Pears shot the Tory, ending his life. Only when both the governor of Louisiana and the Japanese consulate got involved was Pears finally arrested, after which he was acquitted of manslaughter. Sometime in the early hours of Halloween 1981, 
Manhattan couple Ronald Seisman and Elizabeth Platzman were slain in their Chelsea apartment. The couple was severely beaten before being shot execution style with the apartment completely ransacked. New York police initially believed drug money to be the motive, but then the case took a turn for the bizarre. A prison informant claimed that one of his fellow inmates had predicted the crime weeks before it actually happened. The inmate turned out to be the son of Sam killer David Berkowitz. Berkowitz had long been rumored to be involved with a satanic cult that helped him with some of his with some of his misdeeds, and according to the informant, Berkowitz had told him that his cult was planning to enter a residence near Greenwich Village. Chelsea would qualify for that on Halloween to carry out a ritual slaying. When questioned, Berkowitz claimed that Seisman had footage of one of the Son of Sam shootings and was planning to hand it over to the authorities in exchange for dropping some controlled substance charges. While no evidence was found to support Berkowitz's claims, he was basically right about the description of Seisman's apartment, and the crime still remains unsolved today. On Halloween nights, 1993, a group of five Pasadena gang members opened fire on trick-or-treating teenagers returning from a party, killing three and wounding three others. The gang members were soon arrested, and police determined that they'd fired at the wrong people. Three bloods were found guilty of the crime. Los Angeles hairstylist Peter Fabiano was slain on Halloween night, 1957. He opened his door for what he thought was a trick-or-treater, but was actually a grown-up in a costume. The adult shot Fabiano in the chest with a 22 and a brown paper bag before fleeing the scene. Several weeks later, Golden Heiser, that was the guy's name, Golden Heiser and Joan Rabel were arrested in what turned out to be a deftly plotted crime of passion. Heiser was friends, or possibly in a relationship, with Rabel, and Rabel was also apparently in love with Fabiano's wife, Betty. The two women conspired to get Peter out of the equation, and Rabel bought a sidearm, or Heiser, to shoot Peter with. The arrests kicked off a firestorm of lurid coverage, as lesbians in the 1950s were seen as ab uh, abnormal monsters with dangerous urges. The two pleaded guilty and served long prison terms. On Halloween 2011, Taylor Van Deest was leaving a party in the small town of Armstrong, Canada. She never came home and was found beaten to death near a set of railroad tracks. The event traumatized the town, especially after it was revealed that she'd sent a text to her boyfriend before the attack saying that she was being creeped on. Police eventually used DNA found under Taylor's fingernails to arrest Matthew Forster for carrying out the deed and his father Stephen for helping him to cover it up. Fort Dodge, Iowa resident Marvin Brandland and his wife were handing out candy to trick-or-treaters in 1982 when a man wearing a mask came to their door. He said, trick-or-treat, give me your money or I'll shoot. The Brandlands thought that it was a Halloween prank and tried to remove the man's mask. Instead, he barged into the house and pulled out a sidearm, demanding that the couple give him his money or give him their money and that they had, uh, they had stashed in their basement safe. Marvin made a grab for the masked man's gun, and the robber shot Marvin in the throat. He then ran away, but left the mask behind. In the years that followed, Marvin's wife perished, and the mask was tested for DNA evidence. As virtually nobody knew about the safe, suspicion fell on the Bradland family, and a family member did brag about committing the robbery, but there's never been enough evidence to charge him. Chris Jenkins was a 21-year-old student at the University of Minnesota. He was last seen leaving a downtown Minneapolis bar on Halloween night in 2002. For months, his body was discovered in the Mississippi River. Still, um, four months later, that is, his body was discovered in the Mississippi River, still wearing his Halloween costume. Since Chris was intoxicated that night and he appeared to have drowned, authorities initially believed his demise was either an accident or self-inflicted. But his parents refused to believe this and pressed for a more thorough investigation. Finally, in 2006, the death was reclassified as a homicide. Police claimed that an incarcerated suspect told them that he was present when Chris was slain and then thrown off a bridge into the river. While the story's credible, there's never been enough evidence to file charges. However, one possible theory is that Chris Jenkins could have been a victim in the mysterious and unsolved Smiley Face murders. These bizarre killings involved approximately 40 male college students in the United States who all drowned. 
In some of these cases, unexplained smiley face graffiti was found near the body of the water, where, where in the body of water where the targets turned up. With no smiley face graffiti, um, while no smiley face graffiti was ever found in connection to Chris Jenkins' death, the scenario does have a number of similarities to these killings, and it remains unsolved. And we also talked about Penn State student Cindy Song earlier. She disappeared after leaving a party on Halloween night, 2001. She'd been dropped off at her apartment and had gone inside, but nobody saw her after that. And no trace of her has ever been found. The case has taken a number of bizarre twists, and for a while, the investigation focused on a man named Hugo Marcus Solensky. Solensky had been arrested after five corpses were found in his backyard. Okay, five, five corpses in the backyard. Yeah, that, that might make you a little bit suspicious. A police informant linked Solensky and another man to Cindy, Slong, Cindy Song, claiming the duo had kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and murdered her. To make things even weirder, the other man named in the kidnapping was found dead, in Selensky's backyard. More bodies have been found there, but none have been proven to be Cindy, and the case sadly remains open. All right, let's check a few more comments that came in over the last few bit. Um, oh, wow. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not used to getting, uh, what are these called? Um, the chats, the, I can't remember what the super chats. Is that what they're called? You actually give money through YouTube. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I'm not asking for that at all. I really appreciate it. But Lindsay gave a dollar and, uh, Kurt gave a dollar 99 super stickers. That's what they're called. Thank you guys. That's really, that's, I, that's really kind of you. I really appreciate that. Uh, Steve said, when I tried to watch the live stream on Facebook, it wouldn't let me comment. Uh, all I said was, hi, Darren. Uh, well, thank you, Steve. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, you, you have to use StreamYard. You have to log in in some certain way, connect StreamYard to Facebook in order to comment. So um, that, that, could, that could have been why you weren't able to do it. Uh, Natasha says, so glad I caught this live stream tonight. Well, I'm glad you caught it too. Thank you very much. Um, Seal says the smile face murders. I remember that really scared me to death. I'm I'm trying to remember if I covered those in the podcast in the past. I might have to look and, and see. And if not, I'll definitely have to bring them. Uh, bring them. More than a century ago, an unnamed journalist was tasked with running around Washington D.C. and asking notable politicians the burning questions of the day. No, not 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 those about national politics, the the, the burgeoning movement for women's suffrage, or even the war on the tango. Yeah. Instead, this no-doubt future Pulitzer Prize winner asked U.S. cabinet secretaries and senators, what was your most memorable Halloween? <laughs> I'm guessing October 26th, 1913 was a really slow news day, which never happens anymore. Remember slow news days? Anyway, my ears hurt just thinking about how today's politicians would answer this question. I mean, fortunately, 1913 was a simpler time, as well as an off year for both presidential elections and pandemics. In those days, if the newspapers are to be believed, trick or treat came with the very real possibility of a trick instead of a fun-sized candy bar, as some senators learned the hard way. From the Evening Star, October 26, 1913, Senator Atlee Pomerain of Ohio, during his later years, has rather looked down on Halloween, and yet frankly admitted that on one Halloween occasion his hair rose like the quills of the more or less well-known fretful porcupine. It was like this, said Senator Pomeroy, and I have no idea if he sounded like this, but this is the voice I'm going to use. It was like this. When I was a boy, it was more or less traditional exercise to go forth into the highways and byways and remove gates with certain of the boys in our community, it was a sacred ritual to remove a certain number of gates, take them to an open lot, and have a glorious bonfire. Okay, now don't judge him too harshly, weirdos. Remember, this was before children could plop themselves down in front of screens for hours on end. Anyway, he continues. One Halloween, many, many years ago, I discerned a gate that appeared to have been left for the very purpose I had in mind. The matter of removing it and carrying it away occupied but a moment. Then, with my proud burden beneath my arm, I started to started to where the rest of the gang had gone. 
walk into the open field where the bonfire was to be arranged. I heard footsteps behind me. No matter how fast or slow I walked, the footsteps continued behind me. At first, I suspected that a policeman was following me, but when I glanced around, I could see no one. When I reached the field, I, st I started in to, to wait until somebody should show up. I presumed that I waited about an hour. Finally, I got tired of waiting. The rest of the crowd had not yet returned, and I began to fear that perhaps they had deserted me and gone home. It was nearly midnight, and a hollow, moaning wind had arisen. St stooping to the pile of gates, I struck a match and lit the pile. In an instant, it blazed skyward. There was a flash of flame, and satisfied, I stepped back and prepared to watch the performance. Then, to my horror, the gate which I had plucked began slowly to crawl out of the fire. There was something savoring so of the, of the supernatural in the movements of that gate that I could not budge. I was chilled with terror, absolutely petrified, like a person in a dream who wants to awaken but can't. It became terrible, the suspense of waiting. Slowly but surely, the blazing gate began to crawl along the ground away from the fire. I watched it for a moment as it sneaked along, leaving a trail of cinders behind it. I gazed again and again saw the haunted gate crawling away toward the brush fire yards away. Sick with terror, I was about to leave when I chanced to see a glint of metal wire, a copper cord. At that moment came a chuckle, a laugh that was human. Then I discovered the cause of its strange crawlings. It was fastened to a copper wire which was run through the shrubs into the hands of my companions. They had followed me after directing me to the old gate, which they had intended all the time that I should take. When I removed it, I did not notice that one of the Confederates had already attached the wire to it. They followed me back to the bonfire ground, knowing full well that I would not wait, while, wait a while for them and then start the business of the night, lighting the fire. Never in my life have I had such a lesson in the value of private property. Incidentally, I might remark that that was my last Halloween celebration of a destructive nature. Afterward, I contented myself with parties of a milder and more lawful nature. <laughs> so, what have we learned here? Well, property damage is bad, yes, but but uh, more importantly, if your friends abandon you in a creepy field at midnight, you should probably just go home and make some new friends. Senator Pomerine wasn't the only one with a horrifying Halloween haunting, though. After this story, the investigator, uh, the uh, the after this story, the investigator went into the ways of witches with public men. Went into the office of Senator John Shafroth of Colorado, who enjoys the reputation of being a singularly solid and non-believing man who takes care of the facts and leaves the fancies to themselves. So, what was your greatest Halloween experience? The investigator inquired. That is a question, replied the senator. And again, I have no idea if he sounded this way, but that's what I'm going to do with it. That is a question. That is fraught with sorrow in my memory. There was a, then there was a pause, and I think, he said reflectively, that Halloween should be abolished. It is a dangerous thing to stir up the witches and the sprites. One can never tell where it'll end. Actually, we do know, Senator. It can end in bonfires, haunted gates, and character-building experiences. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Anyway, back to Senator Shafroth. By the way, continued the Senator, did I ever tell you that I held... Uh, a world's record for running the half-mile distance? This is how it came about. Some years ago, a great many, in fact, when I was a boy, I attended a Halloween party near our house, and after remaining there until about 11 o'clock, I started on my way homeward. It was a rather dark walk in those days, for the electric and gas lights were not then small-town luxuries. Coming along the blackened road on a cloudy Halloween night, I got as far as the long lane which led to our house when I beheld something flickering in the trees. At first, I paid no attention to it. Then, as I got nearer, I gazed up, and there, apparently sitting on a branch of a tree, was a hideous, yellow, glaring face fixed in a deadly grin. The body was of white. Even as I watched it, I, I could see it sway from side to side like some great bird. I was so terrified that I couldn't move. I looked again at the creature, which seemed to be bending down towards me. Its eyes were glowing red like the fires of the inferno. Its nose was a glowing blue, 
The cavernous mouth was simply a ghastly slit without a shape. Even as I was taking my last look, the thing lurched toward me and fell simply and fell almost into my arms. It was then that I broke the world record for the half mile. I say half mile, it may have been more. I never attempted to calculate exactly the distance, which I put between myself and the creature. The next morning I returned to the spot still trembling and examined the eerie thing. It was a cleverly devised pumpkin head with colored glass for the eyes and nose. Four candles were so arranged in it as to give an almost human expression to the eyes. A long sheet was on the body. The senator then paused. I have always regretted, he concluded, that it was not possible for me to have had a stopwatch on the half mile which I ran. I believe this to be the most wonderful part of the whole adventure. Well, if you're venturing out in search of candy this year, take a page from Senator Shafroth and bring along a stopwatch. You might not uh, be able to outrun cor coronavirus, but you can definitely beat a disembodied pumpkin, and you might as well break a world record while you're at it. I'll be back in just a second. All right, uh, let's get uh, some uh, some more uh, comments in here real quick. Um, Seal says, some pranks going too far. I can't believe it. Lindsay says, I'd like to watch him li uh, live more often. His stories are comforting to me. Well, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I've debated doing this more often. It's a lot of work to do a, a live stream, but now that I know that those videos aren't going to work, it won't be quite so tough. Um, I might consider doing this a bit more often just for the fun of it. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, Lindsay also says, love his ability to change his voices into certain characters. That's a huge talent. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's one of the things I love about what I do. Um, being a voice actor, I, I get to create new characters all the time and, and do them. Um, that's one of the things that I'm really loving about this new Micro Terrors Scary Stories for Kids series, because it, it requires me to, to create new voices. That's also one of the reasons that I like the Weirdling Woods series which I really need to get back to now that Halloween's uh, just about to end. Uh, I'll have more time so I can get back to those stories. But again, it's because I get to create characters. I just, it's one of the reasons I also like, you know, um, Creepypasta Thursdays or Thriller Thursdays, as we're calling them now. Same same concept. Uh, let's see here. Um, it was a pretty tough life for him. The cops did, who are we talking about? Another man. Oh, I don't know. Oh, Wow. Lindsay also gave me a sticker. Thank you. Love Weird Darkness and what Darren stands for. I, $5. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I really appreciate that. That's really kind of you. Natasha says, as somebody who struggles with depression, I love all you do to help your podcast. Uh, you do. To help your podcast has gotten me through a lot. It's a great to see somebody who truly cares about people. Well, thank you, Natasha. That's, that's very kind of you to say. I appreciate that. I don't care about people. I, I, I couldn't care less. But I'm kidding. I'm obviously kidding kidding um kurt says i appreciate all that you do with the podcast love spooky stories have my own personal stories to tell but i think it's great that you advertise to help those who need it well yes um kurt if you do have personal stories send them in go to that tell your story page at weirddarkness.com and uh, you can do that okay i think uh, music in the breaks is amazing well good that's probably what i'm gonna end up doing in the future uh instead of doing the music videos the songs and stuff like that I'll just have to do these quick little music video things for like a minute or so uh, for my breaks. That's about the only thing that I can do that I know I'm not going to get kicked off of YouTube and Facebook for. Uh, Ryden says, hi, enjoying the live stream. Thank you very much. 
Zark says, hit that like button all. Yes, please do. Please hit that like button. I'd appreciate it. Um, Seal says, I focus on your stories and what they're about. Um, that way it's something I can talk about. Oh, nice. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually water cooler talk. I like that. <laughs> Monica. Uh, hi, Monica. Says, I love this. I started my morning at 4 a.m. listening to a new podcast and now going to bed listening to new ones, too. Well, I'm glad to be there for you, Monica. Glad to, uh, I guess, in a way, rock you to sleep. So, uh, okay, let's see here. I think I've got time for one more giveaway, I think. Yes. One more giveaway. Okay, all right, so what I'm going to do with this one then, uh, let me get, get back over here. Uh, for this giveaway, it's going to be a little bit longer because I promised you at the beginning of this uh, of this uh, live stream that I would show you the decorations on the outside of the house. You guys were seeing them from the doorbell version, from the doorbell perspective, uh, but you didn't see them like if you're coming up to the house from the sidewalk or something. So here's what it looks like on the outside of the house. Hey, weirdos. Well, in uh, years past... We've been doing the live stream indoors so I can utilize uh, multiple elements, but I thought I'd show you guys what our house looks like on the outside. That's the original weirdo wagon before we bought the new one. But Robin likes to drive it around with the wet magnets on it anyway. <laughs> so. I believe we actually have something on the other side of the wagon, too. Let me see. This is my first time looking at it. Robin was out, outside all morning putting stuff together. Oh, yeah, there we go. She absolutely loves decorating for Halloween and Christmas. She does such a great job. The wreath is just a fall wreath, but it has orange lights. So at night, it, that actually... Um, not, not necessarily glows, but you can see the little light bulbs, kind of like, kind of like the holly, you know, like in a, in a Christmas wreath. So he's new; I haven't seen him before. We always have floating ghosts hanging from the uh, lights, but I have not seen and seen one with that with that facial expression. Okay, I've got down here. We have him every year. He's made of metal, so he's lasted for a really long time. I don't believe he is... I don't believe I've seen him before. I think he might be new as well. This is the sidewalk. As kids walk up, this is what they're going to see. Down here it says, Yes, I'm a witch. Deal with it. Trick or treat. Another metal... The very first year that we did the uh, live stream, I was on this bench right here, but there weren't nearly as many plants when that happened. There's no way I'd be able to do that now. Down there, there's a little pumpkin spider. This is that corner back there. This is my favorite. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll come back to that there's, at a better angle. Another metal. This one's made of wood. He's new as well. Happy Halloween. Look at that. It's even got the price tag still in the back. <laughs> All right. So we'll zoom in. That's a metal skeleton frame that we found a black plastic pumpkin to put on and then we also found the skull mask to put on top of it so it's kind of our own creation let me rephrase that kind of robin's own creation she's she's really the mind behind all of this but there you go this is a better angle this is my favorite part of our, our halloween decorations every year she goes out and buys a couple hail bales hay bales and then you probably you may have seen those those bodies in stores in the past and it's your job to find a pumpkin to put on top or whatever and she's found a lot of plastic or um, styrofoam pumpkins to put on them and and we just kind of mix and match them you can see the one very back there in the corner 
the skeleton. He's his head's a little bit more yellow than orange. Right next to him is the witch with the purple hair. And she went out and found not only the not only the head, but she found a hat to go with it. Down here, on the as people are walking up, they can see these. And him, he, we've had him for a long time. Down there, we'll haunt for treats. <laughs> we started getting into gargoyles recently. So she found a little gargoyle down there. We've had these guys for a little while. The black cat and the ghost and the pumpkin. These, however, are brand new. I've never seen those before. Robin hits estate sales, by the way. These, are, these aren't things that you typically would find at a spirit Halloween store. She likes a lot of the vintage stuff, and so do I, actually. I, I, lo I love the look of it. It's still family friendly, but still has that Halloween feel to it. There's the door. I don't know if I showed that to you already. It says beware, and then the, what, below it, it says beware of witch with attitude, and then the happy Halloween banner. On the other side of the, of the uh, sidewalk. You're surrounded on both sides when you're a kid walking up here. There's a spider. Let me let me get in front of these guys to give them a better look. There you go. There's the spider. This guy, I believe last year or the year before was our first year with him. And cute, creepy at the same time, but he's also animated. So if I wait here long enough, you said there he goes. He goes back into the pumpkin. Stays there for a little bit. Wait a little while, and he'll come back up. Eventually. Definitely not for kids with a short attention span. There we go. There's a black wreath that has uh, little, the bulbs around it are actually tiny little skulls. Robin also got on to a kick for a long time collecting tins, mostly for Christmas, but then she started finding Halloween tins, so she started collecting those. So that's what these are. Little wooden ghost, wooden bat. <laughs> that back there, that's her sun tea that she's making, not part of the decorations. Okay, and then of course, what every get, everybody gets everybody's attention are the large inflatables, which we've had these, I think what, three years, four years, I think? We have the black cat, which is a big hit with the kids. We've had the ghost for a while as well, and the dragon. She bought the dragon specifically for me because she knew I'd love it. The wind's blowing a little bit, so it's so it's got its uh, left wing kind of flapped behind it. But the wings actually do move back and forth, back and forth. So there you go. That, oh, I didn't show you the front, the front window. And I don't know if, we, if you're gonna see it so much with the glare. I'll zoom in. We got a couple of ghosts right there. Their cloth ghost. We have the scarecrow there that says Happy Halloween. We leave him out um, all fall long, all the way through Thanksgiving, just because you know it's, it's fall decor. Who cares if it says Happy Halloween? He used to be animated. He used to uh, rock back and forth, and his eyes would light up. But when you plug him in now, he makes so much noise. He's so old that we're afraid he's going to break. So we just don't go that route. And there's a couple other. Scarecrows. Zoom in. There you go. It's kind of hard to see with the glare, but we have a boy and girl scarecrow there in the window. And there you go. That is the outside of Marlar Manor. All right. Well, um, one last story for you. On Friday, October 31st, into Saturday, November 1st, 2014, Sean Ritchie traveled in a van with a small group of friends 
on the A981 to a remote farmhouse in the Greenburn area near Strachan in Scotland. He vanished without a trace from the woodland near the Kershiel farm. Sean had been at home that day in Fraserburg with his family before visiting a convenience store and left with friends to celebrate Halloween. Later that day, on November 1st, two emergency calls were made to police from the Greenburn area, one requesting help, the second canceling the requested help. Who exactly these calls came from is unclear. It was one of the largest coordinated missing persons investigations in Scottish history. After this huge search, only his shoes, hooded top, and belt were found. But Sean has not been seen since. Medical experts believed he may have become disoriented in freezing conditions and stumbled into a bog, but no remains have ever been recovered, even after years of searching. So what happened to Sean? Murder? Hypothermia? Accidental drug overdose? Something more sinister? The Halloween Mystery from Scotland. Extensive and detailed searches were conducted with assistance from every specialist air, land, and water resource, with more than 200 officers covering more than 15 miles of ditches, rough terrain, and large water areas. Police also used forensic soil scientists and geoscientists. The searches were conducted with the help of the Grampian Mountain Rescue Team the Aberdeen, Tayside, and RAF Kinloss Mountain Rescue Teams, a dive and marine unit, a dog unit, and police Scotland air support. A patch of neighboring woodland to Kershill Farmhouse comprised of rowan, ash, and spruce trees It was heavily searched during the initial investigation. At the time of his disappearance, Sean was wearing gray jeans, a white t-shirt, and a gray hooded top. The family enlisted the help of Glasgow Group K-9 Search and Recovery and its human remains detection dog in 2015, but the Springer Spaniel failed to pick up a scent. Five days after Sean was last seen, Thursday, November 6th, the special, uh, specialist search teams recovered items of his clothing from the area near Greenburn. These items were found in a bog. Shoes, hooded top, and belt. Nothing else. In August 2016, Sean's mother, Carol Ann, was charged with wasting police time. She believes her son was harmed. She even called in a psychic to visit the search site who now supports her theory. It's believed the charges relate to anonymous text messages that she sent to Sean's close friends and family, suggesting that Sean had been murdered. Charlie Reed, Sean's father, was working in Saudi Arabia when news of Sean's disappearance broke. He said on the bad days since his son vanished, it's hard to function. Charlie was critical of the investigation by police Scotland and has stated his belief that Richie was killed over a debt. A review by the major investigation team in Glasgow of the work of police Scotland was done, which included a review of forensic work and search activity carried out as part of the investigation. Detective Chief Inspector Fianila McPhail, who oversees the inquiry, said, we fully appreciate how hard it must be for Sean's family with another year passing since his disappearance, and my thoughts are with them at this difficult time. Our inquiry into Sean's disappearance remains one of the largest ever missing person operations in the history of Police Scotland. Chief Inspector Stuart Drummond said, To date, these reviews have all concluded that this remains a missing persons inquiry and there's no evidence to suggest that Sean has been the victim of any crime. We will, however, continue to keep an open mind and I can provide every assurance that we will act on any new information provided to us. Friday, October 31st, 2014. Last seen by his mother on Friday evening at home in Watermill Road in Fraserburg. That same day, CCTV images capture Richie visiting a convenience store in Fraserburg. Friday, October 31st into Saturday, November 1st, Sean travels with friends to a farm in Greenburn area near Stryken. Sunday, November 2nd, Mr. Ritchie is reported missing at 8.45 p.m. on Sunday evening. Thursday, November 6th, police officers recover several items of his clothing, including his shoes and his belt, from the Greenburn area. The farmhouse near where Sean Ritchie was put up for sale, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the farmhouse near where Sean Ritchie uh, disappeared was put up for sale for $350,000 in May of 2015, and so far, that is the final entry in the case of missing person Sean Ritchie. 
who disappeared on Halloween. All right. Well, uh, before we before we call it quiz tonight, let's, uh, let's check out a few more uh, comments. Uh, let's see here. We've got uh, Seal saying, Darren, I love your live stream and your stories. It's my day a bit more, makes my day, I guess, more creepy, which I love you. Thanks for doing this every year of my tradition. Well, you're very welcome. And I appreciate you being here with me uh, for this tradition. Uh, Lindsay says, on my worst days of being depressed, your stories get me through. I can't thank you enough for that. You're very welcome. You're very, very welcome, Lindsay. I, I consider it an honor uh, to be here doing this. Um, Owen says, this is the first time I've seen your face, and I love the podcast. I listen every day. Well, I hope the face hasn't scared you more than the stories. Uh, Janine says, do you have a P.O. box where we could send you stuff, Darren? I do epoxy resin art and would love to send you something for Christmas. That is so sweet of you, Janine. Um, yes, there is a P.O. box. If you go to the contact page at weirddarkness.com, there's a mailing address there for you that you could send stuff to me, but you don't have to. I, I greatly appreciate that, though. That's very kind of you. Uh, let's see here. Owen says, this is the first time I've seen your face. By the way, I love the podcast. I think I just, oh, I, I think you posted that a couple of times. Okay. Uh, Angela uh, commented on the decorations saying that they are awesome. Uh, Michaela says, oh my God, I love dragons. It's even on my profile bio. Uh, Zark says, eh, sun tea. <laughs> I'm guessing you're not a fan of sun tea. Uh, Janine says, mini pearl syndrome, LOA, LOL price tag. Uh, that, wow. That, that is a pull from, from uh, way back. Yeah. Okay. See, old weirdo whacking. I wish I had that in my driveway. Um, well, pay me enough, maybe. Um, just all in one resource says, very cool decorations, Darren. My favorite stories are the exsanguination of Burroughs, Wisconsin, the showers, my property isn't normal, I drive for Cerber, and many, many more. Well, um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the exsanguination of Burroughs, Wisconsin is also called the Hool. And uh, that's actually, I think that's, is that available as a, as an audiobook on my page. I've done so many of these now that I, I start to lose track. Let me let me check here real quick. I think that's that's available in the audiobooks page at weirddarkness.com. Let me double check here real quick. The uh, um da -da 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 -da, colors pen pal blow up Savannah Black. Um Okay. No. Okay. It's yeah, it's not one of the audiobooks, but it's an episode. So uh, the reason I ask is that it, is, it did come out as a book. Um, but it uh, looks like just the podcast episode is, is out there. But if you just look for The Exanguination of Burroughs, Wisconsin, or if you look for The Hool, W-H-O-O-L, if you look for that on WeirdDarkness.com on, on the search function, you'll find that uh, for those who have not already seen it. Um, my property is a normal... I drive for Cerber. One of the most popular episodes that I've ever done. Um, it was a lot of fun to do too. It's again, it's, it's another one of those stories where I had to create different voices for each character. Um, but Borg, of course, was the, <laughs> it was really, really fun with that one. And I had a, I've had a lot of uh, comments on that particular episode. Natasha says, uh, love the decorations and weirdo wagons. Uh, Gina says beautiful yard and weirdo wagon. Thank you very much. Kurt says, saw one of the giant skeletons in a nearby in a neighborhood nearby. Um, yeah, not we've not we've not gone that far yet. We've not gone to these skeletons. One thing that I did not show you this year, um, because we didn't have it set up, uh, I have a full-size werewolf standing up. He's about eight, seven feet tall. And uh normally he's here in the office, uh, but we moved him out to the family room. But he was not set up when I made the video earlier, so you didn't get to see him. I'll have to make sure that to show you that uh, some sometime, maybe next year, or, or maybe just like on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram or something like that. So uh, let's see here. Uh, Monica wants to know if we can get a, a tour at Christmas time too. Uh, how about we do a live scream for Christmas? We could do that. Um, I don't. Let, let me think on that. I mean, I, I could definitely do a video and show you all the Christmas decorations. I mean, that's no problem, but. Um, I'm having so much fun tonight that I'm, I'm kind of wanting to do live streams a bit more often. Uh, now that I'm kind of getting into the groove of things and I know what can be done and what can't be done, what YouTube and Facebook will and will not allow, uh, 
uh, I think I can make this a bit more often. Maybe not with all the prizes and everything, because that gets expensive for me. But still, doing this live, I know you guys kind of enjoy uh, watching somebody doing their job. Um, we'll see. Uh, uh, Jenny says, great job, Robin. Kurt says, decorations are cute. Jenny says, love the house. Dee Dee says, love your dragon. Uh, Laura says, my mom and dad asked uh, ask to listen to you in the car. My daughter is a fan and loves the coffee. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, Grim Naval says, dope podcast. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween right back to you. Uh, let's see here. Steve says, I suffer depression as well. Listening to your podcast helps me a lot. I really appreciate that, man. I, I really do. Um, Lindsay says, yes, Halloween live screen. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll consider it. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. Nicole says, Christmas live screen would be awesome. Uh, Natasha, Christmas live screen would be amazing. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, I'll think, I, I will definitely think about it. Okay, I mean, you guys. <laughs> Oh, I am such a pushover. I am such a pushover. All right. But I have had a blast tonight, guys. I really have. This has been so much fun. Um, so thank you for watching. Um, this is my last opportunity to ask you to uh, to help in raising funds to combat depression and suicide, too. Um, our current fundraiser, uh, let's see here. Our current total right now is, let's see here. Double check real quick. $5,174. Uh, and you still have uh, a little under three hours left to give. So if you've been waiting until the last minute, this is the last minute. So please give as much as you can if you've not already done so. Uh, you can make that donation of any amount. And uh, um, it, it, I'm, lo I'm losing track of my, of, of, of my mind. Uh, it, I've been at, I've, we've been at this now for over four hours. So my mind is starting to get drained. But give generously. And give now. If you want to give it to me as a birthday gift, tomorrow's my birthday. My birthday starts in three hours. So if you want to give it to me as a birthday gift, you consider that. How's that? Anyway, if you liked what you heard today and what you saw, please share this with somebody you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. And please leave a rating and review of this show in the podcast app that you listen from. And if you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, be sure to hit that like button, the subscribe button. Um, if you want to email me with your questions or comments, I can uh, use those in a, a, a Chamber of Comments episode. Uh, and I do those fairly regularly now because I get a lot of uh, correspondence from you guys. If you want to drop me an email, it can be about anything you want. Just send it to Darren at WeirdDarkness.com. There's the email address right there. Um, WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, not just Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, you can also listen to the audiobooks that I've narrated. You can shop the Weird Darkness store. Uh, you can sign up for monthly contests, like similar to what I've done in this episode. I do that every month uh, with the uh, email subscribers. And then I also do a, an episode or a, a uh, giveaway for the Weird at Work contest for people who actually listen at work. Um, and also uh, on the on the you know on the on the uh, site, you can find that Hope in the Darkness page. So if you are somebody, you know, struggling with depression or dark thoughts, that's where you can go to find resources to help you. Also on the site, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. And all stories in Weird Darkness, at least in this episode, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness 2020. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And a final thought from Sheen and McGuire. The problem with people who say monsters don't really exist is that they're almost never saying it to the monsters. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.